My prayer for you. God I lift up this reader to you right now. I pray this reader will be inspired to perform random acts of kindness to others. I pray God that you will help this reader to serve with their time, their talent, their love, and yes, their wallet. I pray that this reader will live with peace and have a humble attitude as they seek to spread sunshine. I pray this reader will be a blessing to their neighbors, their friends, their church and their co-workers. I pray that this reader will constantly stand on God's promises. I pray that this reader will love Jesus Christ first and foremost. I pray God that this reader will see others through your heavenly perspective, and will cherish each person as unique and valuable. We want to view everyone through the lens of love. I pray this reader will not give in to excuses, but will be excited to live with a generous heart. Any small attempt at growing the kingdom of God creates massive advancement for eternity. I pray that this reader will become the best representative for Christ, representing their faith honorably. I also make this commitment Lord as we all live each day on our knees, fully appreciative of what you have done for us. We are here to serve you, follow you, and love you. Use us Lord to make a difference and to be the sunshine in this world. I pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Sunshine Rogers is an international best-selling author on Amazon. She has written 12 books which have landed on 26 different bestseller lists, including number 1 in the United Kingdom, number 2 in the United States, and number 25 in Canada. Her books have been translated into several languages, Spanish, English and Portuguese. She has participated in five book tours and dozens of book signings. When she is not writing, Sunshine is a guest and featured author on radio, podcasts and online magazines. Sunshine is a brand ambassador, a blogger, and an entrepreneur to her 35,000-plus social media followers. Sunshine is married to the love of her life, Travis, and they reside in sunny Florida. Books by Sunshine Rogers Christian Nonfiction God the Father, Jesus the Big Brother, Holy Spirit the Best Friend Be the Sunshine Dash 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 Inspirational Fiction The Characters Within Andrew's First Act Once Upon a Time in a Dental Office Dash 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 Christian Fiction This Is My Heaven The Creation Project The Ring Does Not Fit Dash 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 Dark Christian Fiction after you, a demon is always lurking nearby. The Roland Sisters and the Spirit Program. Dash 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 dash. Children's Books. Last Night When I Prayed. Helpers, A Rescue Mission. A True Commitment. We love because we have the fullness and satisfaction of receiving the love of a Savior. John chapter 15 verse 12 AMP puts it simply. This is my commandment, that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another, just as I have loved you. If you are reading this right now and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want you to know that making the commitment to serve Christ was the best decision I've ever made. Knowing that the God of the universe loves me and cares for me, gives me hope. I know that all my cares are met, my prayers are answered and my life is in God's control. What a glorious feeling to know that I can receive God's divine love and grace any time. Let me ask you this, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven? I don't want you to give me a vague answer like, you have always attended church or you're doing the best you can, or you try to be a good person. Salvation is not based on a person's performance. Be real with yourself. Do you honestly confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? While we were all sinners, Jesus offered his love and forgiveness towards us. John chapter 3 verse 16 NIV says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave, he paid the penalty for our sins. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 MSG says, 
He used his servant body to carry our sins to the cross so we could be rid of sin, free to live the right way. His wounds became your healing. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 to 10 NLT makes this claim, If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Let us admit our deep need for a saviour. Let us cling to the realization that we cannot do life on our own. If you want to receive this gift of salvation, repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I am in need of your grace and your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins on the cross and resurrected from the grave to showcase your undeniable love for me. I turn away from my sins to become a new creation in you. I cannot get into heaven through good works or by being a good person, but by trusting and confessing in the name of Jesus Christ. I now invite you to come into my heart and into my life. I will follow Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Saviour. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you have said this prayer and believed in your heart that your complete focus and desire is on Jesus Christ, then, welcome into God's family. I would encourage you to join a local church that teaches the Word of God and surround yourself with fellow believers. Write to me about this moment, www.sunshinerogers.com slash contact dash us closing parenthesis and I will celebrate with you. Embrace this life of peace, joy and fullness. Remember, the promises of God are available to you. You are on the road to complete restoration and victory. About the publisher. Accepting manuscripts in the most categories. We love to help people get their words available to the world. Revival Waves of Glory focus is to provide more options to be published. We do traditional paperbacks, hardcovers, audiobooks and ebooks all over the world. A traditional royalty-based publisher that offers self-publishing options, Revival Waves provides a very author-friendly and transparent publishing process, with President Bill Vincent involved in the full process of your book. Send us your manuscript and we will contact you as soon as possible. Contact Bill Vincent at rwgpublishing at yahoo.com Part 1 Act in Kindness What makes someone stand out to you? Is it her stunning look or her outgoing personality? Do you relate to someone based on the clothes she wears, her makeup, or her stylish hairdo? You might have shared interests or similar backgrounds that make you feel tied to another individual. But I would dare say that you connect with those who genuinely care about what is going on in your life. We are all walking around totally consumed and completely enamored by our own needs, our own wants, and our own desires. Case in point, I am working on this book during my lunch break while the rest of my colleagues are downstairs enjoying a small pizza party. I believe there is nothing wrong with pursuing personal goals, but can we be present and grateful for the moment? Can we stop and look at another human being? Can we choose to help others instead of being so self-absorbed? Talking to myself, can I put the pen down and join the party? There are plenty of people in your life who love you and are truly loyal to you. But my question is, when was the last time you gave a little love back? Is there anyone around you nearby? A co-worker perhaps? A family member watching TV on the couch? In my case, security guards working out in the lobby of a corporate building. Can you do something for me? Extend an act of kindness right where you are. Say something positive to someone around you. A good job or I appreciate you, or a thank you for being you. Bring a little sunshine into the room. If you are reading this book in the privacy of your own home, I would challenge you to text someone, I am thinking about you or make a phone call just to check up on a loved one. I'll join you. I'm texting my husband right now to tell him that I love him. Remember, even if someone doesn't respond, at least you sent positivity out there. It's our effort and our willingness to act that creates love in motion. Sometimes we put too much pressure on the words. 
Sacrifice. Selfless. Serving. Humility. Giving. I know I do. But this does not have to be a stressful concept. It's being aware of the opportunities that come our way. The people in your life right here and right now are no accident. God sent these specific people to you for a reason. So at the very least, smile at strangers walking past you in the parking lot. Wave at your neighbors. Strike up a conversation with the store clerk or thank the cleaning crew for making your office smell lavender fresh. You don't have to do a lot to make the world a better place. You don't have to do a lot to make the world a better place. I want to introduce you to Jeff Hosfeld. You'll be hearing from him a lot throughout this book. Jeff is a retired sergeant with over three decades in law enforcement, 17 years in the armed forces and currently serves as a chaplain for Volusia County Sheriff's Office. You can read more about Jeff and his experiences in the acknowledgement section. Jeff and I both serve on a prayer line, clocking in to meet the needs of God's people. I ask Jeff a very basic yet profound question, what do you do to make the world a better place? Jeff thinks for a moment and quickly responds, I believe that I help make my world better by allowing God to use me to utilize the talents and abilities he has given me to share the love of Christ. I think we all should be active in our communities, otherwise, we have nothing to complain about. Be out in your community and be willing to be used by God while making a difference. Jeff encourages me to stand up and be proactive. I can't just sit and be a bystander to life. I need to be intentional about spreading the sunshine. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 27 to 28, MSG, says to never walk away from someone who deserves help, your hand is God's hand for that person. Don't tell your neighbor maybe some other time or try me tomorrow when the money's right there in your pocket, emphasis mine. I may not feel like I have a lot to give, but the truth is, I have plenty of items in my love utility belt. Let's get started on how you too can be the sunshine. Be a blessing. You are a blessing when you can make someone smile, help them to forget about their bad day, show them kindness and assist them in any way. You are a blessing when you can make someone smile, help them to forget about their bad day, show them kindness and assist them in any way. Luke chapter 3 verse 11 NLT makes this statement clear. If you have two shirts give one to the poor. If you have food share it with those who are hungry. I think this is a relatively simple statement, give to others. Well, what should we give? The answer, what do you have? There are certainly times when fear and insecurity grip me and I can be closed in and selfish, but I was taught that sharing is caring at a young age. I want the act of giving to be in my DNA, and generosity to be flowing through my veins. Matthew chapter 10 verse 8, MSG, says that you have been treated generously so live generously. This verse is a call to action but let me warn you it will mean taking your eyes off of yourself. Giving to others and being selfless is a choice. I want to show kindness as a way of expressing my care for others in my family, out in my workplace, and in my community. I can give of my time by volunteering or serving in a ministry. I can donate charitable funds to homeless shelters or missions. I can give my clothes and other household items to the needy. There are a million ways to give. Let's have a sacrificial heart and be receptive to all the opportunities around us. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28, NLT says to use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. I want to work hard at my job for multiple reasons. I want to pay my bills and financially contribute to the needs of my family. I also understand that I am blessed to be a blessing, knowing my disposable income provides an opportunity to give into God's kingdom and to meet the needs of others around me. I strive to be a faithful and loving person who leaves my hand and my heart open for others. I will say this, you are truly blessed. You have God's hand of favor and goodness over you. I encourage you to share God's love through your sacrificial giving and find new ways how you can be a blessing. 
Spread the joy. Serve others. Matthew chapter 23 verse 11, NLT, talks about the importance of servanthood. The greatest among you must be a servant. This is a big deal. When you keep your ears open, you will hear the desperate cries of people who are struggling financially. Can you give to them? There are those who are weak in their bodies, unable to fully function in their mobility. Can you step up and be a good friend? There are people who feel depressed and discouraged. Can you encourage them? Being a servant will require you to be patient, humble, accessible, and willing to help. Being a servant will require you to be patient, humble, accessible, and willing to help. I serve on a prayer line for a prestigious ministry. I love talking about God and the Bible to callers. I love bringing light into others' darkness. When people have no one else to talk to, they can talk to me. I am a good listener, very patient, and give advice and godly counsel to each caller. I bring empathy and understanding to each conversation. I am very grateful for this assignment God has opened for me. Jeff Hosfeld shares his personal experience with me. I serve as a volunteer chaplain for my local sheriff's office. I often deal with people going through a difficult time. I try to resolve their situation as best as possible. I see how this is God's new plan for me in my retirement, and the Lord is showing me over and over again how He is using me to reach people. I love how even in his retirement years, Jeff serves as a beacon of hope and light to his community. There is never a better time than right now to be the sunshine. It says in Proverbs chapter 22 verse 9 and KJV, He who has a generous eye will be blessed for he gives of his bread to the poor, emphasis mine. A generous eye means, offering a car ride when someone needs one or volunteering to help when no one else will or listening to a person who needs some undivided attention. Just be there for someone. Period. This call to action is extremely taxing. I get it. I have my own schedule and my own agenda. I am someone who has each hour of every day accounted for, but I need to allow for some wiggle room on my schedule. When God tells me to move and to help, I need to respond with openness and a flexibility to share my faith and love. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10 NIV says that God is not unjust, he will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Know that God sees your kind deeds and he is very pleased with your ministry efforts. Shower your community with sunshine and goodness. Love is a universal language. Let's take the time to serve others. Share peace. I feel like our country is so divided lately. I see people on opposite sides, insistent on their own way and attacking anyone with opposing viewpoints. Can we just not? We are the United States, aren't we? Well, can we just stand united? There will be people who think, act and live differently than you. That does not mean you put them down, berate them, coerce them to your side or ignore them altogether. In this world today there is quite enough anger, retaliation, enough revenge and violence. Can I be the one who initiates peace and chooses to walk in unity and love? We are all humans with the same basic needs, love, acceptance, understanding, friendship and mercy. We shouldn't be against one another. Let's find some common ground and view people as God sees them. Each person is valuable and precious. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 encourages me to make every effort to live in peace with everyone. Let me challenge you before you post something on social media, ask, will this offend someone? Before you gossip to your co-worker, ask yourself, is this spreading unity in my workplace? Before you argue with your spouse, think, am I creating harmony in my marriage? Let's initiate peace wherever we go. I am a believer in Jesus Christ, so I am sure my social media posts about the Bible may offend some people, but I try to be sensitive about this as best I can. I may not agree with you. You may not agree with me. But we can certainly get along and not allow our differences to get in the way of a friendship.
Whenever there is tension or strife, I encourage you to drop the disagreement, stop the argument, shake hands and just let it go. Whenever there is tension or strife, I encourage you to drop the disagreement, stop the argument, shake hands and just let it go. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 15 NIV makes this concept clear. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, emphasis mine. We shouldn't arrive on the scene demanding our own way, pushing our faith on others. The act of loving in a peaceful way is listening, responding out of kindness, and bringing out the best in others. I am an advocate of being friends with people first, while sharing the gospel in a loving way. I want to pause here and introduce you to my friend Tim Strommer. I currently work with Tim and Jeff Hosfeld on the prayer line. Tim married his high school sweetheart and is a father of eight and grandfather to three. Tim is the president of Jesus Food, JesusFood.org, a non-profit dedicated to ending starvation worldwide. You can read more about Tim's biography in the acknowledgments section. I will be speaking to Tim Strommer many times throughout this book because his strength as a family man and ministry worker are so vital to these pages. I asked him how he maintains peace in the home since he has such a large family, and his answer is priceless. Peace is a gift from God. Peace brings light and it guards our hearts and minds. When my kids would fight, my wife and I would calm them down and then pray with each child and have them make it right with their siblings. Sometimes correction or discipline would actually free their hearts, and there would be lots of hugs after. I love Tim's answer. My husband Travis and I live in harmony and tranquility within our four walls. No, our house is not a spa-like atmosphere with a masseuse and a running fountain and nice easy-going music playing all the time, I wish. But peace in our marriage means that we try not to judge or be critical of the other. We listen openly, encourage often, and support the other 100%. If we disagree, we are quick to end the banter, drop our pride and show humility. I want my house to be an escape from all the stress and trials in this world. I pray God will send a spirit of peace over you, as you give your concerns, worries and fears over to him. Relax in his care. Peace begins in the heart. Be a spreader of joy and goodwill wherever you go. It makes all the difference in the world. Pray for others. Pray for me is a line I hear quite often. A friend will tell me how her day is going, share an update about her life and then end the conversation with. Pray for me will you? Back when I was fairly new in my Christian faith, I didn't take prayer requests seriously, falsely believing that prayer isn't necessary. I thought the situation or issue will just work itself out so why exude energy and strength on something that may or may not work. I admit I didn't quite understand how fully powerful prayer is. James chapter 5 verse 16 AMP speaks more on this subject. The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, believer, can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God, it is dynamic and can have tremendous power. Prayer is not something to shrug off or quickly dismiss. Prayer that is deeply seeded in the Word of God and fully ignited by faith greatly improves the situation, invites in the presence of God and ultimately changes lives. Prayer is not just an end to a conversation, but the beginning of a miracle. Prayer that is deeply seeded in the Word of God and fully ignited by faith greatly improves the situation, invites in the presence of God and ultimately changes lives. Let me introduce you to Stephen Stein who also works at the same ministry with me, Tim Strommer and Jeff Hosfeld. Stephen is the supervisor for the prayer line, managing a team of 40 associates. Stephen has over 30 years of ministry experience in various leadership roles within the church, including nine years of higher education at a Christian university. You can read more about Stephen and his experiences in the acknowledgments section. You'll be hearing a lot from Stephen throughout this book. Stephen shares a personal story with me, highlighting the power of prayer. When I was in college, I became mentally sick to the point where I was suffering from debilitating depression. I was unable to get out of bed for days. I suffered from severe anxiety and panic attacks. 
As I lay there praying crying out to the Lord for help, I heard his still small voice. He gave me these words from the Bible, For God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. I prayed and thanked the Lord for this scripture. Stephen continues his story. I started to speak 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 out loud to proclaim this word over myself. Instantly I felt something happening. I just started to feel different. As the next few days passed, I felt prompted by the Lord to continually speak this word out loud and over myself. Each day, I started to feel better and better to the point where I could rise out of bed and get back to living my life. The anxiety completely left me and the panic attacks stopped, never to return. I received freedom through prayer which is our direct communication with the Lord. This is why I believe prayer is important. I love Stephen's story about receiving healing and experiencing a breakthrough from prayer. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. If you are going through something extremely difficult right now, pray to God about it. Utilize that direct communication to reach heaven about your needs, wants and desires. Maybe you can relate to Stephen's story and you are currently facing a mental battle. Speak God's promises out loud and cry out to the Father for help. Jeff Hosfeld shares his personal battles and how prayer helped him at his darkest hour. There is power in prayer even when we don't know what or how to pray. When I was going through my battle with cancer, there were many times when I felt like I could not go on. Even when I don't feel like God is working, He is and has always gotten me through. As I look back on those truly difficult moments, I see how the Lord carried me, and is now using my personal experiences to point others to Christ. Jeff's story reminds me that God is my strong rock and constant support even during trying times. Dear reader, let me pray for you right now. I pray that God will move in your life and answer your personal requests. I pray that God will reveal himself to you in a loving and mighty way. I pray that you will feel God's presence and the assurance of his power and sovereignty in your life. Fast forward many years later and now, I take prayer very seriously. If someone asks me for prayer, whether the request comes through a text on social media or in an email, I am quick to respond. I won't just shove the request aside but I will say I can pray for you right now, assuring that person that I am indeed interceding for their needs. I am notorious for typing up my prayers and sending that text to the person. So if you ask me for prayer and you can, write to me at www.sunshinerogers.com slash contact to dash us closing parenthesis, I will respond and cry out to the Lord on your behalf. Several people have told me that they like reading over my text prayers as a source of encouragement and comfort. I write out my specific prayers and send them via email, text inbox or direct message so the recipient can read them again and again, and hopefully be blessed by my words. I will sometimes include scriptures to go along with my prayers so that person can stand unwavering on God's promises, more on this in part 3. I am a big believer in fasting and praying, and I live a lifestyle on that biblical principle. I have seen prayers being answered suddenly and quickly when I fast and intercede for others. Whenever I participate in a long fast, I always text and email people asking if they need prayer. During that regulated time, I don't want to just pray for my own needs, even though I do. I want to take that long hiatus with the Lord to pray for the needs of others. Because I have an international following on social media, I will receive prayer requests from people living in places like Africa, Canada, India and the United Kingdom. I believe in the power of prayer and the power of agreement. I know prayer encouragement and a positive word can truly bring some sunshine into this world. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 NIV states, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Let us humble ourselves and take the time to stop and pray for people. Let us spend time in God's word, repent of our sins and change our ways. Let us drop to our knees and beg God to intervene in our families, our church and our country.
We need heavenly help now more than ever. Offer forgiveness. I want to extend forgiveness. If someone I love does something to offend me, I will show mercy and grace. I may talk to that person about the offense, but I do need to let it go so I can forgive and move on. If someone I love does something to offend me, I will show mercy and grace. Jeff Hosfeld recalls a relationship in his life that needed to be mended with God's help. Almost 20 years ago, my mother passed away and my brother and I stopped speaking to each other. I finally reached out to him after all those years and apologized for my part in what happened after our mother was gone. This action has allowed me and my brother to start working on repairing our relationship. We realize that there is fault on both sides and though we cannot change the past, we can both make positive changes moving forward. If you need to reach out to a loved one, forgive their faults or apologize for something, now would be a good time. If this is a friendship or relationship that you want to keep in your life, one you truly care about, then make the decision today to patch things up and resolve the issue to build a stronger relationship. Forgiving the transgressions of people I care about is easy. My friends and loved ones are important to me, and I will do whatever it takes to solidify those relationships. Praying and forgiving my enemies, dot now that can be a bit more difficult. Dash 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 dash. Pray and forgive our enemies. I admit I'm having a hard time writing this section, but the truth is that when it comes to dealing with my enemies, my reaction to them needs to be more Jesus-centric. I'm sorry that this section is a bit longer than the others. I feel I need to slow down and cover all aspects of this subject. Let's step into this process of forgiveness and healing together. I completely understand the relationship you have with your enemy. There are too many differences, too much pain and rejection, too many complications in the way, and for whatever reason, you two just cannot be friends. I consider an enemy in my life to be someone who is not on my side, someone who does not support me, someone who puts me down or discourages me. Someone, for example, like that mean-spirited manager who caused me to feel anxiety attacks because she was never pleased with my work performance, or that relative who still refuses to accept me and my life goals. I also consider someone who is against my husband an enemy. Luke chapter 6 verse 28 AMP is a reminder to bless and show kindness to those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. I'll be honest, the last thing I want to do is bless those who curse me. I have practiced this verse and let me be straight with you, not all blessings towards your enemy will be well received. I once had someone mail me back a gift I gave to her. My attempt to patch up an old relationship failed, and she clearly didn't want my present. So if that doesn't work I need to pray blessings over my enemy and I will pray something like this, God I give you blank, insert your enemy's name here. I pray God that you will pour out your presence over her life. I pray God that you will protect and guide her. I pray that her eyes will be open to you, her ears to hear from you, and her heart to receive your love. I pray blessings over her and I pray your provision and mercy over her life. Thank you Lord for taking care of this woman and I do pray that she is saved, delivered and set free by your hand. I may need to pray this prayer several times and with the Lord's help. I truly do want the best for this person and for her to find God and to be healed and delivered, so that she can live a full and abundant life in Christ. Praying specifically for my enemy opens my heart and changes my outlook towards that person. I want to pray out of a sincere heart, a humble spirit and with the right attitude. I believe that God can and will turn the situation around. When I pray for that person who has wronged me, my heart becomes concerned for my enemy's well-being. I have a genuine interest in seeing my enemy become the woman of God that she was created to be. Prayer helps me to relate to my enemy in a loving way. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 31 to 32 MSG reminds me to make a clean break with all cutting backbiting profane talk. Be gentle with one another and sensitive. Forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ forgave you. I add this verse right here because even though I have fully and completely forgiven my enemy, 
I am still tempted to say bad things about her. God has really spoken to my heart about this issue. I realize that saying nasty things will make me more like my enemy and less like Christ. So let's get rid of the excuses for our behavior towards our enemy. I still have a responsibility to watch what I say and what I do. We cannot claim to follow a God of love and then be a person who ridicules, mocks, criticizes and puts down others. I don't want to speak negatively about anyone, no matter who they are. I need to show kindness no matter what. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 21 MSG makes the message clear that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy him lunch if he's thirsty, bring him a drink. I am not supposed to ignore the needs of someone, even if I do consider that person my enemy. I remember one time I was working with this manager at a corporate office, and she and I just did not get along. Our personalities immediately clashed. There was one day when this manager arrived at work wearing a very short dress, and was told by upper management that she needed an extra layer of covering to look more appropriate at the office. I was wearing leggings with a long skirt so in theory I could help her in her predicament but instead I thought to myself, she can buy tights on her lunch break or she can drive back home to put on some long pants. How is this my problem? Why should I care? Instead I swallowed my pride and spoke very kindly to this woman, you're about my size. I have a long skirt on. Do you want to wear my leggings? Though she didn't accept my offer, I'm happy I reached out. Like I said previously, your enemy isn't always going to appreciate the kindness you show, but still take the high road and be the bigger person. A side note, you can also show love by what you don't do. Don't talk back, do not start arguments or gossip and don't engage in office drama. Your overall goal is not necessarily to turn your enemy into your friend, though that has happened in my life. Your goal is to be the best representative of Jesus Christ to those you get along with, and to those you don't. Luke chapter 6 verses 35 to 36 MSG says to love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way our Father lives toward us, generously and graciously, even when we're at our worst. Our Father is kind, you be kind. Matthew chapter 5 verse 45 echoes this statement, explaining that God sends the sun to rise on the good and the evil, and pours rain on the righteous and unrighteous. Let us be more like Jesus Christ. I pray that God will open our hearts to be more loving towards our enemies. Luke chapter 6 verse 37 MSG cautions me. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless of course you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down, that hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people, you'll find life a lot easier. I like this verse because it reminds me that I cannot condemn my enemy for being flawed. After all I'm not perfect either. I can only imagine that those who hurt me have been hurt themselves. But I stop the cycle and move past this. I can only hope that God will grab a hold of my enemy's heart and transform her life. The way I try to look at it is, well, maybe this person had a painful childhood growing up and she doesn't realize how she is treating people. Or maybe this mean-spirited person is going through some personal problems and just requires a little patience and grace. Maybe this person needs the love and light of the gospel in her life. And when I stop and think about this, I am more prone to pray for my enemy and love on her because I know she is God's child, and I need to recognize that. I am not saying to make excuses for your enemy. I have someone in my life who is like a porcupine. Whenever I try to get close I only keep getting hurt. I fully believe that her past pain and residual fear are the reasons for her anger and controlling behavior. Her presence negatively affects me. So I will pray and intercede on her behalf and I will trust that God will personally move in this person's life. I fully give my enemy to the Lord and allow God to personally take care of her, when it's clear I cannot, more on break the ties in the next section. I'm going to be transparent with you. 
When someone treats me wrong, I want God to go after that person with righteous indignation. I want God to punish those people who are controlling, manipulative, mean-spirited, and who make me cry. God get them. I think to myself. Make them pay for what they did to me. Proverbs chapter 24 verses 17 to 20 MSG, convicts me. Don't laugh when your enemy falls, don't gloat over his collapse. God might see and become very provoked and then take pity on his plight. Don't bother your head with braggarts or wish you could succeed like the wicked. Those people have no future at all, they're headed down a dead-end street. I cannot celebrate when I see my enemy get what they deserve, but I sure want to. I pray that God will give me a loving heart towards others as I show compassion and humility, especially when people I don't necessarily get along with are down and out. Did you know that extending forgiveness is another way to show love? Even if that person lives a thousand miles away, even if you don't even deal with that particular person anymore, dot you can still forgive, thereby releasing the hurt and pain that person caused you. Let me stop here and introduce you to a good friend of mine, Marcia Baker. I met Marcia at our local church and we both attended a leadership class taught by Ileana Reyes, you'll meet her a little later. Marcia is a wife, a mother, and a strong woman of faith. You can read more about Marcia in the acknowledgement section. She shares such great insight and wisdom here and in the chapters ahead. I ask Marcia to share a little bit about her past and she tells me, I needed to forgive my dad for abusing me when I was young. I had forgotten about the abuse until I was in my late twenties, and it was hard to face after so many years of denying it ever happened. I received professional counseling and finally, I was able to forgive my dad. Though my father has since passed on, the act of forgiveness set me free. I asked Stephen Stein if he ever had to personally forgive someone in his life. His reply is a definite, yes. Stephen opens up to me about his painful experience. When I was six years old, an incident happened to me by an adult friend of the family. This event broke me internally in ways I wouldn't come to realize until later in life. When I was 30 years old, I was walking with my brother and he brought up the incident. As this horrible memory came flooding back into my mind, I realized I had blocked it out as a way to move past it. I believe the Lord allowed this memory to happen because I needed to forgive that person. Stephen shares with me, I spent some time with the Lord and I forgave that adult through tears of remembrance and pain. The Lord spoke to my heart to not only forgive him but to release him as well. So in obedience to the Lord I spoke those words out loud, I not only forgive him Lord but I release him from what he did to me. And then what happened? I encourage Stephen to continue his story. I began to weep but in a way of freedom, Stephen explains. Forgiving that man freed me and I was able to experience healing. Releasing that man and his actions lifted the heavy burden I didn't even know I had been carrying for so many years. Forgiveness is very important. I believe Stephen and Marsha's stories can really resonate with those who have suffered abuse or trauma from their past. Let's learn from Stephen's example and pray for forgiveness so God can start the process of internal healing. If you have been through a similar situation, please follow in Marsha's footsteps and seek professional help, so you too can experience total freedom. Forgiveness is the act of giving that person and our pain completely over to God. I don't have to hold on, keep a grudge or get angry whenever I hear the mention of my abuser's name. I am not putting her down. I'm not scoffing at her existence. I'm not hoping that something bad happens to my enemy. I am literally saying, God, you take this person. You take this pain. I do not want to hold it in any longer. I forgive blank my abuser's name for what she did to me, what she said to me and how she treated me. I forgive her and I release her now into your hands. I am literally saying, God, you take this person. You take this pain. I do not want to hold it in any longer. Tim Stromer is quick to chime in. The Lord says we must forgive. 
Some of my kids have walked away from us and the Lord. If I don't forgive, then a root of bitterness wells up in me. When I forgive, I experience peace and freedom. It's amazing. Break the ties. I have learned that forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconnection. You can forgive someone and not be tied to that person any longer. If you had someone in your life who abused you and you forgive them, please do not allow that abuser back into your life. That would be unwise and only guarantees more pain and personal stress. You can forgive in your heart and still be cautious around those who devalued your worth. Unless that manipulator, trickster or abuser is truly repentant of their sins and fully transformed by the truth of the gospel, that person needs to stay far away from you, for your peace and for your sanity. I don't care if this person is a friend, a teacher, an aunt, a sibling or a parent. Make sure there is always an intentional distance between you two. Forgive and move on and enjoy your life without them. I'm going to break it down for you. Is there anyone in your life who steals your joy, robs you of your peace, stresses you out, tries to control or manipulate you, discourages you and does not believe in your dreams, calls you names or laughs claiming it's just a joke at your expense? You can love these people while at the same time maintaining healthy boundaries. The truth is, you cannot help everybody. Those individuals who don't respect you, your values, your friendship, or your personal goals are not worth your time and attention. I give you permission to screen their calls, block them on social media, and just focus on living your best life. It's interesting that I am throwing this little tidbit in here, as this is a book about how to be the sunshine, but I had to personally learn this lesson the hard way. Sometimes, you need to show love at a safe, respectable distance so that you don't continue to get hurt over and over again. Use divine wisdom when handling these types of relationships. When you forgive, you will feel free from the past to pain and the hurt. You can rightfully talk about your abuser without getting mad or emotional. Disengage from those people who drag you down. If you are having trouble breaking the ties and letting go of the past, I would advise you to seek professional counseling or a local pastor. Let God guide you on your path to full deliverance and freedom. God has a way of using our personal stories to shed light into others' darkness. Similar to Marcia Baker and Stephen Stein from the earlier section, share your story of forgiveness and healing, and hearers of your testimony will be inspired. I know that God in his infinite mercy and selfless love has forgiven me when I do something he doesn't like. When I betray the Lord or dishonor his name, he chooses to forgive me. I need to copy that example in my own life and forgive others as well. I may not be friends with my enemies, but I can still show kindness when I speak about them or treat them cordially when I see them. I want to take the high road. I walk into my new season with strength and favor knowing my past is fully behind me, and my good future lies just ahead. When I practice forgiveness and move on, I will live the abundant life God has planned for me. When I practice forgiveness and move on, I will live the abundant life God has planned for me. Part 2 Shout Goodness It is the sudden happiness you feel when someone says to you, good job on that meeting. The relief to have one friend by your side in a room full of strangers. When you strike out in the game of life, yet you hear someone on the sidelines still cheering you on. Don't those moments of praise and adoration seem like a literal lifesaver? I truly believe in the importance of encouragement. In fact, the gift of exhortation is one of my spiritual gifts. I love reminding people of their value and worth and speaking things that are positive and affirming. I love calling out the potential of others and reminding people of their individual talents and strengths. If you see someone who possesses a certain skill set, applaud them. Promote their style and praise their creativity. Encourage people around you to pursue their dreams. Be a fan and supporter of others and watch them bloom and prosper right before your eyes. Can I be honest with you? Life can certainly beat me up. Or worse I can beat myself up. 
I get in my head and stand in my own way. I can easily blow things out of proportion and overreact. I am my own worst critic and harshest literary editor. I for one desperately need encouragers and supporters in my life to remind me that nothing is as bad as it seems and to take one step at a time, to walk it off, shake it off and keep moving forward. Walk it off, shake it off and keep moving forward. A good word. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 25 ESV explains that anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down but a good word makes him glad, emphasis mine. I want to bring that good word into someone's life. I want to tell someone that he is doing just fine, that this problem is temporary, that there is going to be a way out, and that God is going to work a miracle. And I say this with absolute certainty in my God. Romans chapter 15 verse 1 minus 2 MSG talks about how those of us who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter, and not just do what is most convenient for us. Strength is for service not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? Emphasis mine. Is there someone you know right now who is worried, stressed or anxious? Maybe you have a friend who is desperately looking for a job. Maybe someone you know is going through financial difficulties or dealing with the loss of a loved one. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 NLT challenges me. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. I'm the first to admit I'm not perfect. I'm guilty of having a bad attitude. I want to throw a pity party and toss my hands in the air in defeat. I have been upset at the things in my life I don't understand. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29 helps me to maintain another, sunnier perspective. Can I look on the bright side of things? Can I find the silver lining? Can I be grateful and thankful for what I do have? Can I encourage and build up my faith in the Lord? This sounds weird but I have been known to talk to myself. I'll say things like, Sunshine it's okay to cry. I'm allowed to feel sad. This is going to get better. God you've got this. It nourishes my soul to do some self-care to encourage myself in the Lord and to stand on His promises. I strive to be spiritually mature, mentally strong and emotionally stable, so that I can be used to help others in their faith journey. I have learned time and time again that the more I serve and the more I pray and the more I minister to others, all of a sudden my spirit is refreshed and my mind is renewed. I suddenly feel strengthened and rejuvenated just by helping others and staying positive. Helping others and staying positive not only makes other people feel happy, but it also affirms your spirit as well. Jeff Hosfeld shares in my excitement. Having been in law enforcement for so many years, I often deal with many people going through difficult situations. Some people express how thankful they are for the care and compassion I show them, and that encourages and strengthens me. Sometimes I do struggle with not being able to help everyone, but I realize that they must do certain things and be responsible to improve their own life. I cannot do it for them. I have battled cancer and still deal with issues as a result of the treatments, and I often see how God uses others to help me through these tough times. God also uses my testimony to point others to the victory and hope we have in Jesus Christ. Similar to Jeff and his desire to help everyone, I often struggle with the superhero mentality where I want to be there for anyone who needs me, but I realized I do not have the resources or the answers to help every single person. However, if I can't give anything else, I can always extend a word of encouragement to someone. I can point the way to Christ, His truths and His promises, no matter the situation. I can remind others that Jesus Christ is with them, or I can just hold their hand and not say anything at all, hoping my presence and love speak volumes. I can point the way to Christ, His truths and His promises, no matter the situation. Building up the body. It is important to love the church family because these fellow believers are your brothers and sisters in Christ. We should strive to have peace and unity in the four walls where we worship. 
I define family as those people who believe and serve Christ with you. I define family as those people who believe and serve Christ with you. Matthew chapter 12 verse 50 NLT says that anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. I have that exact verse pinned on my fridge and it reminds me that I have a large church family that I can always count on to pray for me and encourage me. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 to 25 NLT says for us to think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. The Bible makes it clear for us to faithfully attend church. It's not just a responsibility to check off every Sunday, but rather a lifestyle of being around fellow believers. Jeff Hosfeld shares his thoughts with me. I believe it is vitally important to fellowship with others from the body of Christ. We are all human and we all struggle with things, but God often uses the body of Christ to keep us accountable and to encourage one another. We need fellowship and interaction with others to help us through life. It is often a battle to balance things but I do serve in my church and share the gospel to others as God calls me. Marcia Baker chimes in saying that being around Christians keeps me grounded. I can keep my attitude in line with God's word. I love being around my Christian friends. They inspire me, pray for me and encourage me when I'm down showing me hope when I feel helpless. When we love and support fellow believers, this connection creates an unbreakable tie formed from united faith. Let's truly understand the importance of our friends who keep us accountable, who understand our struggles and can point us to Christ in the midst of life's uncertainties. John chapter 13 verse 35 AMP says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love and unselfish concern for one another. We need to stay in close contact with those of the faith, because it is imperative for our spiritual walk. Church Unity 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 NLT states this challenge to the church family. I appeal to you dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind united in thought and purpose. Let us put down our divisions and stand strong with each other. I pray that we will not allow our pride or differences to get in the way. No matter what language we speak, what we wear, our denomination, our age and our background, we need to accept each other and stay humble in our interactions. I want to pause right here and pray for the church. I pray that the church will be a body that genuinely loves and cares for each other. I pray that we will embrace each other with open arms and open hearts. I pray that we will not argue about our differences but instead, focus on our similarities. I pray that our mutual love for Jesus Christ will bind us together. I pray we will be humble towards one another, not fault-finding or causing division, but genuinely wanting what's best for the other person. Thank you God for bringing a spirit of peace and unity into the church. If you have been hurt by the church or by another Christian, I pray you will leave your pain at the cross, pick up Christ's freedom and choose to forgive the offender. I pray that you will stay connected to the body of Christ. Acts chapter 4 verse 32 MSG shares a scene where the whole congregation of believers was united as one, one heart, one mind. They didn't even claim ownership of their own possessions. No one said that's mine you can't have it. They shared everything. God, help us to be humble and sacrificial towards our family in the faith. I want a heart of generosity that expresses the idea, what is mine is yours. For example, no one should have to twist my arm to tithe to help to serve. I should just want to give to my church. It's so easy to look around and think that the devil has won, that the world is his playground, but if we start to believe that, we have failed. We need to stand strong and tackle each challenge head on. We need to fight the good fight of faith together. No one is an island, we need each other. We need to fight the good fight of faith together. Be the sister or the brother. When you consider someone a sister or a brother in your life, 
you essentially have someone you can turn to, who will offer advice, who won't judge you but will respect and understand you on your level. This person, related to you or not, won't compete with you but will be happy for your many accomplishments and will celebrate your presence in their lives. I feel appreciative of those close friends who in so many ways act like my sister, or brother. To consider someone a brother and sister goes well beyond just a friendship. It's a relationship that sticks close, one that has stood the test of time, one that contains a rich history of warm memories. I would encourage you today to be a spiritual sister or a brother in someone's life. Romans chapter 12 verse 10 ESV says to love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. I love this. What a fun idea. Siblings know just what to give for special occasions, they know all your many details, fun facts and inside jokes. A sibling knows just what to say or what to do to make the moment better. Let's go out of our way to show brotherly or sisterly affection to those around us. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 1 to 2, NLT, warns us to never speak harshly to an older man but appeal to him respectfully as you would to your own father. Talk to younger men as you would to your own brothers. Treat older women as you would your mother and treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. I call my co-workers my work family. I call my Christian friends my church family. Even my close friends that I've known for years are considered family to me. I have this mindset so that I can be the best spiritual sister. I want to embrace each relationship with encouragement, support, love, and understanding. I want to embrace each relationship with encouragement, support, love, and understanding. Hosea chapter 2 verse 1 ESV encourages me to say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. My loved ones, friends, work associates and schoolmates give me a deep sense of belonging and community. I want to love on them and practice patience, mercy and forgiveness towards all. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12, NIV, says that we are to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. We are called to share the truth in love with others out in our community, but we are also supposed to minister to those within the body of Christ. Even a strong believer can feel tired, stressed, depressed, angry or discouraged. We are supposed to be so connected to our brothers and sisters in Christ that we feel what they are feeling, celebrate when they celebrate, and cry when they cry. We are one body. We need to build up other believers and be on the lookout for other Christians who need a pat on the back, a hug, and a good word spoken over them. Be the cheerleader. You don't have to carry around pom-poms in order to be someone's cheerleader. Let me tell you right now that I support you and your endeavors, and I am a fan on the sidelines of your life. Jeff Hosfeld shares his personal definition that being a cheerleader means to be there for people, lift them up when they are struggling or having a bad day, and praising others for the victories in their lives, rejoicing with them. There are so many verses in the Bible that talk about how we can be the cheerleader in someone's life. I'm going to go through my personal favorites. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 30 NLT, a cheerful look brings joy to the heart, good news makes for good health. Keep your eyes bright and stay cheerful. Smile and show excitement to someone and greet them in a nice way. Direct your conversation so that you are speaking about good things and not highlighting negative news. Be glowing and radiant. Be glowing and radiant. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 24, NLT, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. I want to speak pleasant and kind words. I need to slow down and think about what I say, making sure I am always telling the truth and being as positive as possible. My words and my actions create an impact in the lives of those around me. Genesis chapter 50 verse 21 AMP, so he comforted them, giving them encouragement and hope and spoke with kindness to their hearts. I had to stop watching the local news because the broadcast was negatively affecting me and casting a strain on my psyche with all the death, destruction and violence. I want to give others hope for the future. I want to be the one who speaks good news. 
I want to penetrate the darkness with light. I try to present the best possible outcome to others because so often we resort to the worst case scenario. Why do we do that? Why do we stress ourselves out thinking about the future? I try to remind others and myself that something good can and will happen. We just need to have faith. Psalms 21 to 6 CSB, you cheer him with joy in your presence. I want people to feel happy and joyful in my presence. I want people to feel understood and appreciated when they are around me. I hug people. I cheer them on and I make them feel important and loved. Romans chapter 12 verse 8 ESV breaks it down for me. The one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, emphasis mine. Wow! Look at all those powerful words Romans chapter 12 verse 8 emphasizes. Generosity. Zeal. Mercy. Cheerfulness. I want to watch what I say and how I say it. I need to be conscientious about honoring God with my decisions and actions. I don't want to be part of the problem, I need to be part of the solution. Be a friend. As we discussed earlier, it is important to live a peaceful life, even when there is a lot of activity going on around us. Try not to get into unnecessary disputes or rouse up drama. Don't demand your own way. Learn to play well in a group setting and be considerate of the needs of others. Romans chapter 12 verses 15 to 16 NLT gives a command to be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. We are not above anyone else. Let us act in humility and grace. When we see someone in tears, let's be sympathetic. Let us not be so proud that we sit on our holy soapbox and not celebrate when others get their victory. Be a friend to all. It's hard to not feel a smidge of jealousy, especially when I am waiting for a similar blessing to break through in my own life, and it seems God is answering other people's prayers and not mine. But I can't just sit on the sidelines and grumble about it. I need to have a trusting spirit towards God and know that if He can work a miracle for that person, He can certainly bless me. And when I rejoice over someone's good news, I know that my friend will be there to celebrate with me when the time comes. I need to have a trusting spirit towards God and know that if he can work a miracle for that person, he can certainly bless me. Part 3 A Fresh Perspective I must understand that my job is not to change anybody's mind about Christ. I cannot and will not be able to debate you or convince you. All I can do and all I was meant to do is love you. I am not God. Admitting that is the first step. I cannot convince anyone that they need a saviour. I received my salvation by faith and so other people will experience God in their own way. I just need to be the best representative for Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to move. I don't ever want to get in God's way. He has a plan and a purpose for each and every person. The Lord loves my relative, co-worker and friend way more than I do, and I can really do some damage trying to push or shove my personal beliefs on others. I often pray this prayer, God I pray for greater opportunities to share my faith while extending kindness. Let me constantly pour out favor and blessings to others. Show me how to love others with the same amazing grace and unconditional love that you have shown me. Help me to say the right thing and do the right thing and be the best ambassador for Christ. Show me how to love others with the same amazing grace and unconditional love that you have shown me. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 NIV states that in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I have a large social media following and I receive messages from fans and readers. 
Some virtual letters in my inbox are marriage proposals and others are aspiring writers who want my advice on how to succeed as an author. Then there are those who ask me questions about God and my faith. I want to share one in particular. Howard, not his real name, asked me a public question wanting to know how the Christian deity is love, when everything about him, his word, and his people are so loathsome. I was stunned and heartbroken to read his question. I wanted to answer Howard but in the most loving way possible. I answered from a place of humility and on my knees. Here was my answer, I understand where you are coming from. The Old Testament in the Bible is filled with wars, stonings, murders, adultery and then some. Phew. And fast forward to modern day where we have mass shootings and terrorism. It's enough to wonder about God's love for sure. I can also understand where you are coming from about the people who say they believe in God, yet their actions are far from heavenly. I think what helps me when it comes to God's word and his character is looking to the New Testament. The scriptures talk about God as being gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love, Psalm chapter 145 verse 8, his peace through hard times, Isaiah chapter 54 verse 10, his faithfulness to us and his protection around us, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 3. That always helps me to remember that there is good even in the bad. I cannot control what other people do, but for someone who is a follower of the Christian faith, I promise you that I will try to share God's love the best I can in a way that represents my faith honorably. I'm not very good at debating nor do I want to strike up any conflict. I just wanted to address your question the best way I know how. I do appreciate you asking a question on my page. I could have easily ignored his post, but instead, I felt this was just one opportunity for Howard to experience love in action. Be the mentor. I think the best thing we can do for other people is to be their mentor, teacher, and counselor. I pray that there is someone in your life that you can help, someone to whom you can impart guidance and wisdom. Jeff Hosfeld shares with me how he values mentorship in his life. Growing up, the youth leaders in my church impacted my life. And now, in my retirement years, I am mentoring others who are currently serving in the same career that I had worked in for 30 years. I look for ways to show that I care, to encourage and to be an example for them. As I mentioned before, I consider my church to be a part of my family. When I needed spiritual guidance as a new believer, I recognized so many men and women who shared their time, expertise and wisdom with me. These amazing spiritual fathers and mothers in my life are patient with me, teach me so much, pray for me and encourage me in my faith. Without these spiritual parents, I don't know where I would be in my walk with God. And today, I want to pay it forward. Just before writing this, I had an opportunity to provide counsel to someone a decade younger than me. I have a professional background working in the television, media, and entertainment industry for over 16 years. My co-worker wanted my thoughts about working in television stations and my highs and lows in the industry. I took the time to share my personal experiences and offered professional advice. I am also an unofficial consultant for other authors. I receive phone calls or messages from aspiring writers who want to know more about the publishing process and what to expect on their literary journey. I am more than happy to stay on the phone and talk to such individuals, excited to be used in this area. Get to know the people God has assigned in your life for this season and for this moment. Share your expertise, your background, and your experiences. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 NLT talks further on this topic. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. I need to set an example and create a moral standard for others to aspire to and look up to. A fun fact about me, I refuse to cuss. My curse words are curses, golly gee whiz and golly. I always try to create a G-rated atmosphere around me. What happens is my co-workers and friends don't cuss around me. They may start saying a word but then they will see me nearby and won't finish their sentence. I bring a change to my environment and I don't even have to do anything. 
I don't have to say a word. My example sets the tone and raises the standard. Look for ways to be an inspiration to others. Become the best version of yourself so that you can help other people be the best version of themselves. If you talk about how you volunteer at soup kitchens or how you attend a Bible study and set prayer times each morning, your passion and faith will fan the flame to those who hear it. Become the best version of yourself so that you can help other people be the best version of themselves. I also encourage you to share your testimony. People need to hear how God brought you out of a hard time, delivered you from bondage and freed you from personal struggles. Share your good works and God's faithfulness as a way to bring God all the credit and glory. When I was nine years old I started writing in a journal, still do, and wrote countless poems. In school literature, grammar, writing essays and book discussions always came easy and natural to me. I was taking English college courses in high school. I loved reading, still do, and asked for more books on birthdays and holidays. And yet, no one ever pulled me aside to encourage me to be an author. I wish they did. Too many giftings are being unrecognized and too many dreams are left unfulfilled. Let us applaud other people for what they bring to the table. We don't have to be jealous or insecure about anyone's specific giftings. We are all in this together. What I am weak in, you are strong, and for that we make up a family, forming a bond that is undeniable and unbreakable. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 17 AMP challenges me. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens and influences another through discussion. Being a mentor not only helps my protege but also strengthens me as a believer. I am now accountable to pray and stand in the gap for my trainee. I take my job as a role model very seriously. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1 NIV says to follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I want to stand absolute, authentic and firm in my faith. I want to stay sunshine whether I'm at home at work, writing this book or out with my friends. I try to be the same person in public and in private. Titus chapter 2 verse 3 MSG teaches me to guide older women into lives of reverence so they end up as neither gossips nor drunks but models of goodness. I want to be reverent in my behavior. I want to be fully feminine and strong in my ability to represent a godly woman. I have high standards on how to live a righteous lifestyle. You will not find me getting drunk at the bar. You will not hear me cursing no matter how mad I get. You will not see any lingerie pictures of me on social media. I have a reputation to maintain and an image to keep. It is important for me to teach others the same principles that I myself live by. I want to embrace the responsibilities and blessings as a woman of God. I am 100% accountable for what I do and how I behave. I want to make sure that I stay on the right path and do the right thing before the Almighty. I desire to hear God say to me, well done good and faithful servant. It's a mind game. I choose every morning to have a good attitude. I thank God for the day, for each day is truly a gift. I choose to be happy. My husband does not decide my happiness. My work and the weather and my money do not decide my happiness. I choose to be carefree and content because I place my complete and total trust in Jesus Christ. I surrender to God and allow Him to hold my hand through this journey of life. Let's remember that the trials and obstacles we are facing now are temporary. God is good and He has a bright future planned for each and every one of us. I am excited and expectant of the goodness and blessings He pours down each day. Psalm chapter 107 verse 8 NIV encourages me to give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. You can find something to be happy and grateful about. Smile over the fact that the God of the universe is nearby and that he loves you. Rejoice over your salvation and that you get to experience heaven when you transition away from this earth. Be comforted that the answer to your problem is only a prayer away. Be comforted that the answer to your problem is only a prayer away. 
When I focus on what I don't have, I can easily ruin the blessings I do have. I don't ever want to take for granted all the many wonderful things God has done in my life. Don't allow the long waiting process of a yet to be answered prayer be the reason for your frown. Instead, give God thanks that He offers you heavenly support for anything you need. Sometimes life can be extremely difficult and it's hard to praise God or to even find the good. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15 NIV reminds me to continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess His name, emphasis mine. This term, a sacrifice of praise, shows me that worshipping God is a choice, even when it's not an easy one to make. I would encourage you to praise God during your predicament, to find the light even in your darkness, and to stay expectant of God's movement even during seasons of great despair. Jeff Hosfeld reminds me to think on whatever is good, right and holy. When I am emotionally down about things, I look back on the hard times in my past and realize that God got me through then, and I take comfort in knowing that He will see me through now. I need to think the right thoughts no matter what I face in life. If you are having a hard time, please reach out to fellow believers, friends and family. Be honest with yourself, with others, and with God. Tell your close confidants about your feelings and trust them with your heart. You never have to suffer in silence, and you are not alone in this. Don't forget you always have a heavenly family nearby, offering you divine love and support. It's not about me. It's about you. It says in Philippians chapter 2 verse 4, NKJV, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests but also for the interests of others. Make yourself available and accessible to those who need you. Check up on your loved ones, make sure they are doing okay and be sure to pick up on subtle cues and non-verbal hints. We live this life not only for ourselves but to brighten the lives of people around us. I am guilty of missing a moment of opportunity. I can be too busy to notice when someone truly needs me. I can feel impatient and speak over someone when all they need is a listening ear. When I don't offer someone my complete and undivided attention, I am conveying the message that my time and my needs are more important. I need to make sure my actions continually show love, humility and grace. This life is not about me. I want others up on stage with me, sharing the podium. I am not here only to excel and succeed, I need to raise up others as well. I try to keep the focus less on myself and more on those around me. I am not here only to live a comfortable and good life. I am put on this earth to make a difference. I do not have to demand my own way, become argumentative or control others into believing my point of view. I step down and live life on my knees. God is in control. I need to remember that this life is not about me. I want others up on stage with me, sharing the podium. I am really proud of my author career, but the rewarding part isn't how many Amazon bestseller lists my books have landed on or how many author interviews I've done, but that I've used over 60 real-life people as characters in my books. You can read all their names on my website www.sunshinerogers.com. It makes me smile to include other people and their stories on my pages. Let me pause right here and send a shout out to Tim Strommer, Stephen Stein, Ashley Bingham, Ileana Reyes, Marcia Baker and Jeff Hosfeld for contributing to this book, six people who were courageous enough to publicly share their personal testimonies. I want to share the limelight. It's not about me. Stand on God's promises. I know so many people who just think that speaking out loud positive sayings will just magically create things to happen. These people believe in some mystical energy or force of the universe to meet their needs. My complete source is from God Almighty. I have a Jesus time five days a week, a prayer time that lasts 90 minutes. During that time, I will pray for myself and other people. I study the Bible and read Christian non-fiction books. I want to be fed spiritually and mature as a Christ follower. I know that I cannot be used mightily by God if I am spiritually weak, emotionally drained, or mentally inept. 
I need to stand on God's promises, understand his word and have a greater knowledge of his truths. Marcia Baker talks to me about the importance of God's word. The Bible helps me know the truth when the world and the media, including social media, and other people in my life tempt me with other ways of thinking. The truth of God's word is an anchor to keep me strong. If I'm tempted to do something that will hurt the purity of my relationship with God, His word solidifies my path. I volunteer at my local church as I love greeting and welcoming new people. I really enjoy helping newcomers learn, grow and become rooted into the word of God and settled into our church home. I love how Marcia acknowledges how we cannot find real truth out in the world. There is no my truth or your truth. There is one truth, the word of God. I want to introduce you to a fellow writer and entrepreneur, Ashley Bingham. Ashley self-published a memoir, The Lies I Told Myself, which is filled with pages of passion, purpose and self-discovery. Ashley lives her life helping others find their calling and identity in Christ. You can find out more about Ashley in the acknowledgement section located in the back of this book. You will hear more from Ashley throughout these pages. Ashley reveals a certain Bible verse that truly resonated with her. I was in class one afternoon when the words spoken by my lecturer would be the light I needed to guide me on my life's journey, Ashley recalls. I was pursuing my bachelor's degree at a Christ-centered university at the time, so a word of prayer or a devotion of some sort was not unusual. That particular afternoon was different, because it provided me with a mantra that I would hold dear to my heart for the rest of my life. At the beginning of the class my lecturer encouraged us to memorize the Bible verse of Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, NRSV, For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. I am not certain why this particular verse resonated with me the way that it did, but the scripture truly activated my faith, and gave me a safety net that I rely on time and time again. Ashley continues her story. I grew up in the church. I attended Sunday school. I was what you would consider to be a good girl, but my Bible gathered dust. Even though I went to church every Sunday and attended a Christian institution, my personal relationship with God was almost non-existent. But when I heard those words that I didn't even know were in the Bible, something shifted in my spirit. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 holds the promise of God on which I stand. This young writer admits that, not knowing exactly what God has in store for us and giving him free reign to do what he so desires in our lives can be a very scary decision. I was so terrified of giving him control of my life, thinking that I could possibly receive something from God that I didn't want, which would make me miserable. Sounds silly right? But that's how I felt at the time. As I began repeating the words of Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, I could relax because his will for my life is not to harm me, but to prosper me and be good for me. Ashley reminiscences, when I think about my past and I look at today, I can see God's work in my life. Even in the times when I disobeyed him, he protected me in ways that I can only now comprehend. Had it not been for God's grace and mercy in my life, I would not be in the place I am today. I absolutely love hearing how one Bible verse can become the catalyst for greater spiritual growth. I want to know what Ashley thinks about Bible reading and why studying scripture is so important. Ashley shares with me her thoughts. I often felt like reading the Bible was a chore, leading me to avoid reading the Word of God. Whenever I did read my Bible, I would be in a rush. I never really allowed myself time to meditate on the Word. In addition to that, I wasn't reading to understand, I was reading because I knew it was something I was supposed to be doing. It was only when I dedicated quality time to sit in God's presence that His Word began to speak to me. Ashley continues to open up to me about her faith journey. Reading God's word is important, not because it is something that we should do, but because it is the way in which he reveals himself to us. If you feel as though you have been praying but you are not hearing from God, it could be because you have not immersed yourself in his word. 
I feel the most distant from God when I don't read the Bible. God speaks to us in various ways through dreams, through the Holy Spirit, and through the people we encounter, but it becomes difficult for us to hear from God when we don't learn about Him from the literary blueprint that He has given to us. This young woman adds, God knows each and every one of His children. He knows our hearts, He knows our desires, and He is ready and willing to bless us in ways that we can never even dream of. But God is also waiting for us to trust Him, not partially with only a few select areas of our lives, but with our whole hearts. So, whatever promises that you are currently standing on, anchor your faith in your Father in heaven, be fed by His word, and in everything that you do give Him the glory and the honor. Align your desires with His and watch Him change your life. Remember His plan for you is good. A Charlie's story is so important because at times we take the Bible for granted and may view scripture reading as part of our Christian duties. Let's remember that every word in the Bible is powerful. Believing and acting on what we read will produce wonderful results in our lives. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 AMP says, For the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. Every word in the Bible is powerful. Believing and acting on what we read will produce wonderful results in our lives. Marcia Baker says that the answers to life's mysteries are in the Bible. It's the living word of God. You ask me why it's important to read it. I ask you what could be more important. A love letter. Stephen Stein shares his favorite scripture and how this one verse changed his life. One promise of God's word that I stand on is Isaiah chapter 43 verses 2 to 3 NIV. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire you will not be burned, the flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. Stephen explains that this is one of my favourite verses because no matter how situations might feel or turn out, hard times will never ever overtake me because God is my protector, my provider, my shield, my strength, and my deliverer. God is my protector, my provider, my shield, my strength, and my deliverer. Stephen continues, Bible reading provides answers to things I didn't even realize I needed and helps me to grow spiritually. Some have referred to the Bible as God's love letter to us. The Holy Spirit uses the Bible to speak and minister to us and to also helps us to edify and encourage one another. Reading the Bible introduces the reader to God's amazing grace. This is why Bible reading is so important unwavering. Here are just some promises from God's word that we can stand on during life's difficulties. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 NLT, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. God, you give me peace that surpasses all understanding. When my mind is fearful and anxious, you calm my fears, silence my storms and quiet down my spirit. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 8 MSG, God is striding ahead of you. He's right there with you. He won't let you down, he won't leave you. Don't be intimidated. Don't worry. Thank you Lord for reminding me that you are always nearby. Thank you God for never leaving me, not for one second. I am never alone, I have you by my side. I know that you are ready and available to help me, to lift me up, and to encourage me. God you restore my mind and refresh my spirit. I don't need to be afraid, I just have to trust you. Psalm chapter 32 verse 8 NLT, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Thank you God for your advice, your wisdom and your insight. I appreciate your guidance and direction for my next steps. You know exactly where I should go. You are opening doors and providing divine opportunities. Thank you for teaching me and giving me counsel when I need solutions and answers. 
You are watching over me and personally taking care of me. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 AMP, My God will liberally supply, fill until full your every need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Thank you God for handling all my money stresses and financial issues. Thank you God for meeting my needs and for being my source of provision. I ask that you help me to budget my money in a way that honors you. I know that heaven has all the riches, all the resources, and all the connections I need to be successful. I know that heaven has all the riches, all the resources, and all the connections I need to be successful. Psalm chapter 37 verse 4 NLT, Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. I love this promise. My dreams are not too big for you Lord. You will respond to my faith and honor my prayers. You are creating a way where there is no way and removing obstacles in my path. Thank you for being the one I turn to as you make the impossible happen in my life. I stay delighted in you always. Jeff Hosfeld adds, I often think of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 3 to 4 NIV. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. I know that whatever I face, God will comfort me. Even though I am going through personal trials, I need to allow God to use me to comfort others. I acknowledge that God does not always take away my hard times and bad days, but He has promised to get me through them. And finally, since it's so great, I'm going to promote it again, the verse from Ashley Bingham's story. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 MSG, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out, plans to take care of you not abandon you, plans to give you the future you hope for. God your plans are the very best. I surrender my will to yours. I want only the perfect plan you designed for me. When I worry about my future, I give you my concerns and pick up your peace, knowing that you are going to prosper and bless me. You are working things out in my favor. You are turning things around for my good. I will not lose hope. God, you never disappoint me. Let us fully immerse ourselves in God's love letter and feel assured and secure by the author and finisher of our faith. Part 4 The Power of Love it is true that love is an emotion and a feeling, but I would say that love is a choice, a decision to love at all costs and to be a living instrument of God's goodness. I would say love is a choice, a decision to love at all costs and to be a living instrument of God's goodness. I have been together with my wonderful husband Travis for 13 years and my devotion and loyalty to him aren't swayed by any minor arguments, bad days or disagreements. My love for him doesn't stop short, doesn't run out and certainly doesn't demand my own way. I love Travis because I choose to. I will make that same decision to love him tomorrow, the next day, and the day after that. I started my love story with Travis, and it's going to end with us still together because I make that decision to stay through the good and the bad. I made a lifelong commitment to Travis at the altar, and I dare not break my wedding vows. I know that my husband has made that same dedication to me for as long as we both shall live. I wanted to use this demonstration because we need to choose to love, even when we don't always feel like it. We must do the right thing even when it's not always easy. Let's go through all the ways that we can express love on a daily basis. Love God Loving God is easy yet complicated at the same time. How can we love someone we don't see and have never physically met? How can we completely pour our entire devotion to a heavenly father, who isn't even human? It's normal to get caught up in the confusion of it all, like thinking that worship needs to be proper and holy, or that I need to love God only in a church setting. Do I need to say specific prayers, repent of my sins and only then worship the Almighty? Are there rules to loving God? I have found that getting to know God follows the same formula as establishing a friendship. Talk to God ask Him questions spend time with Him and read in His Word all about Him. 
No relationship grows after one interaction, so schedule time every day where you can just get to know the God of the universe. You'll be surprised, developing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is easier than you think, and better than you can imagine. Ashley Bingham describes to me what her relationship with God is like. Growing up I often reassured myself, especially during tough times with the words of a little song that I enjoyed singing as a child, Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so. Whenever I encounter some kind of difficulty, even now as an adult, I utter the words Jesus loves me and this always gives me a sense of peace. Ashley is honest with me. I remember when my life had become so consumed with my job. I did not spend enough time in God's presence to commune with him the way I knew he wanted me to. During that time in my life I felt very distant from God and I knew that my choices weren't in the least bit what he wanted for me. This way of living my life without God caused me to often feel stuck and unfulfilled. It bothered me but I was so distracted by life that I lost my connection with the one who gave me life. This young entrepreneur says with a smile, like most believers I had my coming to Jesus moment. After several turn of events I found myself in a time of nothingness and I began to recognize that I had neglected my relationship with God. I've always known that God loves me, but it wasn't until I surrendered my life to him that I began to fully express my love for him. As I studied God's word, grew my relationship with him and began to truly get to know the God who created me, my love for the Savior has grown exponentially. I know that God is delighted about my willingness to seek him and to make the conscious effort to live my life for him. Ashley states very clearly, my relationship with God is in a much better place now. I see God as my father and my friend. My conversations with him are more open and honest because I know he understands me. I am no longer afraid to pour out my heart to him, and I can be my authentic self while I am in his presence. I've realized that there is no use trying to hide from God because he already knows who I am, and he already knows my heart. I have become more comfortable sharing my testimony with others and speaking openly about my faith without fear or reservation. This is my chance to learn more about who God is and to share my love for him with others as I open myself up to be led and directed by the Almighty. There is a huge difference between reading about God in Sunday school and knowing Father God intimately. As Ashley mentioned previously, you can even attend church all of your life and never truly open your heart to the Savior. Unlike Ashley, I was never a churchgoer growing up until about high school and college age when I became more involved in Bible studies and Christian organizations. To be honest, the idea of loving God in a close and personal way often eluded me. I remember one autumn evening in college, I walked up to the roof of my dormitory. Usually that place is used for small parties or study groups but on that particular night when the moon was high in the sky, I had the rooftop area all to myself. I brought with me a Bible, a journal, and some hot chocolate, and I remember sitting on a picnic table, just gazing down at the university campus below. It was then and there that I decided I truly wanted to know more about the God of the universe, on a personal level. You might think this a tad unconventional, but I read through Song of Solomon, and that book of the Bible allowed me to experience God as more than just an invisible being up in the sky. I was captivated by the verses where the bridegroom adored his bride, where he would do anything to draw her near, help her and rescue her. The following verses truly resonated with me. Song of Solomon 115 MSG, O oh my dear friend. You are so beautiful. And your eyes so beautiful like doves. God calls me lovely, precious and beautiful. I am a one-of-a-kind creation. God is very protective of me, and personally takes care of everything that happens in my life. The creator of the universe is pleased with how he made me, and he is proud of me. Song of Solomon 2.14 NIV, Show me your face, let me hear your voice. This is the heart's cry to my Savior. I want to see his smile and hear his voice. I want to embrace his hug. God can whisper to me in a crowded room and I can clearly hear his voice. 
I want to hear him say good morning when I wake up. I want to experience God Almighty in a thousand possible ways on any given day. Song of Solomon 4-7 MSG You're beautiful from head to toe my dear love, beautiful beyond compare, absolutely flawless. God sees no flaw in me. Though I have plenty of vices, though I fail as often as I succeed, though I doubt and worry, though I raise my voice think critical thoughts and can be insensitive to others. God still sees no flaw in me. I embrace that truth. I believe that when Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins, I am now covered in the righteous holy pure blood of Jesus. And because I believe in and follow this Saviour, even when I do mess up, God still honours the blood of Jesus Christ on me and concludes that I am perfect and spotless in His sight. Song of Solomon 4-9 MSG, You've captured my heart dear friend. You looked at me and I fell in love. One look my way and I was hopelessly in love. Even before I met him God knew me. He wanted me to embrace him as the Lord and Saviour of my life. Even though life's busyness got in the way of that realisation, I am happy that he never gave up on me, and never grew tired of pursuing me. I am content. I am loved. I am adored and sought after by my Creator. There is no greater love. I am content. I am loved. I am adored and sought after by my Creator. There is no greater love. Song of Solomon 6-9 MSG Everyone who came by to see her exclaimed and admired her, all the fathers and mothers, the neighbors and friends blessed and praised her. God sets me up for success and provides me with extreme favor and wisdom. He prepared blessings for me even before I was born, I believe that. God named me Sunshine and I embrace that name sharing light and love to my community. Young women may see me and call me blessed. Indeed I am blessed for serving Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I want others to experience Christ with everything I do and everything I say. Song of Solomon 710 ESV I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. I always wanted to get the word beloved tattooed on my wrist as an association with this verse. Instead in a less painful way I bought a ring that has the Song of Solomon 710 verse inscribed in Hebrew. I know that I am the daughter of the king. I am loved by the Most High. My value is placed on what he thinks of me. My life revolves around Jesus Christ. God feels loved when Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 1 NLT challenges me. You must love the Lord your God and always obey his requirements, decrees, regulations and commands. The best way to love God is to follow him, serve him and be faithful to keep his commandments. I know that I am not perfect, but I have a heart that yearns to be obedient. I keep God's requirements and commands because I want to grow in my relationship with the Savior. I want to stay on the right path, and I desire to do the will of the Father. I try to do the right thing not for my own glory but because I know it hurts God when I commit sin. I dress a certain way and say or don't say certain things because I am very aware of God's presence. The last person I want to offend is Jesus Christ. I live with a reverential fear of the Lord. I want to make Christ happy. I need to trust him, worship him, spend time with him and pray to him. In other words, be here and do life with God. I need to trust him, worship him, spend time with him and pray to him. In other words, be here and do life with God. In my Christian non-fiction book, God the Father, Jesus the Big Brother, Holy Spirit the Best Friend, I talk about the many specific ways to make God feel loved. God feels loved when I pray. I read my Bible. I am thankful for his blessings. I call out to him and we talk. I ask him before I do something. I set time in my schedule for him. I listen to him. I say good things about him. I tell him how important he is in my life. I come to him first to talk about my troubles. I hear him and immediately do what he asks. I introduce him to others. I tell him how much I love him and need him. I want to know more about him. 
I make sure I have no other gods but him in my life. I put him first. I dance and sing to him. I make it all about him. I enjoy what he gives me. I make a big deal about him. I talk to him about past, present and future miracles. I have faith in him. He doesn't need to explain details, I just trust him. I make him my one and only, the love of my life. I stay with him though the good, the bad and the in-between. This is not about working to win God's approval or doing the right thing so I can somehow earn his love. I don't call myself a Christian as a badge I wear or a title I give myself. This really is a personal experience and everything I do and everything I am stems from that one truth, I have a deep and committed relationship with Jesus Christ. Love your neighbor. As believers of Jesus Christ, we need to carry a light in this darkness. That means showing compassion, taking care of others, using every opportunity to do good and to love one another unconditionally. We should embrace each other as friends and that includes those outside of our church home. I like this verse in Romans chapter 14 verse 13 MSG that says to forget about deciding what's right for each other. Here's what you need to be concerned about, that you don't get in the way of someone else, making life more difficult than it already is. On so many occasions, I feel like my argument is right and I stand resolved on my issue. And it's okay that I take a stance on something I am passionate about. But I also don't want to be rude and aggressive in my approach. I think it's easy as followers of Christ to be considered radical with our faith. We sometimes feel the need to wave our Bible and shout our message from the rooftops, demanding to be heard. But can we just stop for a moment and consider what that looks like to others? I remember in college, anti-abortion groups enhanced large photos of babies. Their approach was to show the negativity of abortion. I was greatly disgusted by the vulgar images. Was this the right way to share that particular message? My approach. Let's be friends with someone of differing opinions, backgrounds and belief systems. Get to know each person and understand where they are coming from. We need to show humility, respect and camaraderie to those around us. With that said, I don't approve of anyone intentionally living a lifestyle of sin. I will not applaud every decision a person makes as being a God-honoring one. But as I said before, I am not God, and I've accepted that what people do is between them and the Lord. I am available for people, helping them when I can, praying for others consistently, and more importantly, finding ways to love on them. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 8 AMP says that above all have fervent and unfailing love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins, it overlooks unkindness and unselfishly seeks the best for others. Sometimes it's very difficult to stand strong and be a positive influence to the world. It's hard, isn't it? While we were dating, Travis and I lived in two separate places to maintain our purity. Other couples were bragging about living together and talking about how much money they were saving to justify their decisions. It's hard, isn't it? When I roll out of bed on Sunday to attend church, which may be my one day off while other people are sleeping in or making homemade pancakes. It's hard, isn't it? When my friends go see a popular R-rated movie in the theaters, and I feel convicted not to go due to the content of the film. It's hard, isn't it? When others around me are gossiping about a co-worker, and I refuse to be a part of the conversation. It's almost like the world is one big party and I am not invited. I'm sitting at the loser table, or at least it can feel that way. I want to be a good witness for the Lord, but how can I compete? How can I get the attention on Christ and his truths? If the world is corrupt, full of division, hate and immorality, does the light do any good? And that spurs another question, dot can the good news of the gospel compete in this day and age? Are we too into following the newest trend, binge watching a TV show, or involved in the newest movie trilogy to even concern ourselves with the ways of the Lord? Has the truth of the gospel become non-existent and irrelevant? 
I certainly hope not, and I've been asking myself these questions for seven long years as a Christian author. How can my books compete in a market that is populated with stories about witches, psychological thrillers, or celebrity memoirs? And the answer is, I can't. I gave up competing. The grace of God will lead readers to my books, those who need to read the message and be encouraged by the content. I can't win over everyone, but I can positively influence those God sets in my path. I can't win over everyone, but I can positively influence those God sets in my path. Taking God into the workplace. Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 MSG says not to push your way to the front, don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. I vow to walk into my workplace confident. I will be the one who remains sober while others share stories about getting drunk. I will complete my work on time with a good attitude while others may be groaning or complaining. I will be a friend to all. My hope is that my attitude and the way I handle myself will attract others to my faith. Eventually someone will see me still smiling and will want to know why. I will then have the perfect opportunity to talk about Jesus Christ, invite them to my church and pray for them. My hope is that my attitude and the way I handle myself will attract others to my faith. I don't want to coerce my co-workers or my friends into believing what I believe. I don't want to twist their arm or win an argument or somehow bribe them over to my side, because then their commitment to Christ wouldn't be genuine. That's why I never like seeing people from opposing views arguing on social media. The comment thread is a long back and forth of just antagonist banter. You know no one is winning that battle. My co-workers are of different ages having various belief systems but I don't preach to my colleagues but instead find out what we have in common and build a friendship from our shared interests. I constantly find ways to help them maintain a good rapport and try to develop a trustworthy relationship. I have seen my co-workers later come up to me needing prayer or asking about God but only after I took the time to get to know them on their level and at their pace. During my commute to work I always pray the same prayer, God I invite you into my workplace, and I ask that your presence freely walk around the hallways, in the conference rooms and cubicles. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over me, my co-workers, and this company. I pray Lord that you will move in these individual lives and answer our personal prayers. I pray God that my co-workers will know and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. I pray for spiritual growth and that my fellow associates will go to church, read the word and pray to you. I pray God that you will reveal yourself to me and my co-workers in a very mighty and personal way. I pray that we will have an experience with you Lord that will change everything. I pray God that I will love on my co-workers the way that you love them. I pray that you will help us and bless our work today. I pray that I will have a good rapport with my colleagues and that I will say the right thing, do the right thing and be the best representative to you. I pray God for divine opportunities to share your name and your truth. I pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. You and I have an opportunity to share the love of Christ in our workplaces, in our schools and in other social gatherings, but we need to be approachable and available. We need to act kind and loving. And yes, we need to be diligent about our work. My co-workers know that I am a Christian but if I show up late, give a lackluster effort, and continuously carry a bad attitude, then they are going to think less and less about the God I serve. The actions about what I believe shout louder than what I say. Bag the groceries. Do you know how hard it is to work in customer service? I do. In my life, I have been a server at a casual dining restaurant and a quick-service barbecue eatery. I was a cashier at a department store in a shopping mall. I have worked at a theme park and a grocery superstore. I was also a receptionist at a dental office. And let me tell you, customer service is extremely difficult. From my personal experience out in the field, I learned that I cannot please everyone. I would get yelled at for problems that are not my fault. People leave bad tips or no tips. 
I have little support at the crowded registers. The weather can make people enter a theme park in a foul mood. Certain people with ill intent enter a department store and try to secretly rob or scam the associates. And with the customer is always right policy it's hard not to scream, toss the apron, shuck the vest, slam the phone and walk off. No, I must grin and bear it, plaster on my smile, fake the courtesy and help the customer, hoping I won't have to face that person ever again. I share all this because now whenever I go run errands, I am super nice to the person at the drive through or the cashier at the busy store. I will offer to bag up my groceries at the market if there is no one else to do it. I will organize my empty dishes at the table to make it easier for the server at the restaurant. If the man working at the donut shop is rude or unpleasant, I will smile and be polite and not take it personally. He must be having a bad day, I tell myself. Allow me to have a little sunshine venting session. You know what I hate? When shoppers leave their shopping carts out in the parking lot. I see those carts all over on the grass on the curb and taking up parking spots. I will literally get out of my car and move the shopping cart to its designated area. And while we are on this topic please watch your time. If a restaurant closes at 2.30pm, don't arrive late and then linger through your meal. Let's be conscientious of the workers and mindful of the establishment. There. I spoke my piece. Recently Travis and I vacationed a few nights at an upscale resort. Before we checked out of our room, we collected all the dirty towels and placed them in a pile, organized the trash and arranged the bedsheets. I try to make it as easy as possible for everyone, including those working in a customer service or hospitality role. I try to make it as easy as possible for everyone, including those working in a customer service or hospitality role. Love Walk Did you know that you work in ministry? You may not have a doctrine in theology or a master's in biblical counseling, but you do work in ministry. Every day creates an opportunity for you to share Christ's love to others. There's a sign outside of my church and as I leave the building I read the call to action, entering the mission field. That sign reminds me that I have a calling on my life to share the gospel no matter where I am. As just a recap of what we've learned so far, here are some Bible verses that will encourage you in your love walk with others. Romans chapter 12 verse 10 NLT, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Let's think of creative ways to show our friendship and love to others. Some ideas would be to treat your co-worker to some coffee, offer to drive a friend to the airport, or pay for someone's meal when you invite them out to eat. When you notice on social media that one of your friends is going through a hard time, drop them a text or send a message to see how they are doing. Call someone from your past just to check up on them. Offer advice when needed. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 17 AMP, a friend loves at all times. Let's be conscientious of the other person. What does that person need? Does he want to talk? Does he not want to talk? Ask questions and give him plenty of space. Read the room and look for non-verbal cues. A person can say a lot without saying anything at all. Get to know each particular person and love on them in their own unique way. Luke chapter 6 verse 31 MSG, ask yourself what you want people to do for you then grab the initiative and do it for them. We are all different and what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for someone else. We need to be intuitive of that fact. For example when something bad happens to me I will clam up. I like to be alone, process my emotions and think through my situation. I don't necessarily need to talk about it. So those people who don't fully understand my internal process may make things worse by adding their unsolicited counsel to my ordeal. Be sensitive to each other's needs, they are different from your own. Get to know each person as a clean slate and don't categorize or generalize other people. Love people like they want to be loved and cherish the opportunity to get to know someone. You'll learn a lot just by asking the right questions. Love yourself. 
I am a big advocate for self-care. Be open with yourself and to others about what you need and want, expressing honesty and vulnerability about your feelings. Growing up I didn't have anyone to help me process or to honestly communicate my feelings. I felt one emotion fine. I didn't know how to properly express myself. As a teenager I felt several thousand different emotions all at the same time, but as long as I stayed a responsible good girl I was just fine. I remember when I was in college and I was a youth leader for my local church. A big event took place at a convention. The days were a bit chaotic with all the activities and children to watch over. The madness of the weekend must have shown on my face because the pastor came up to me and asked, Are you okay? I felt mad and almost defensive by the question. I am handling things. I didn't ask for help. Clearly I am in control. In my self-righteousness I thoroughly explained to the pastor that I am always fine. I thought that question am I okay was somehow beneath me. Turns out, I'm not always fine. As a teenager I was so inarticulate about how I was feeling that I would secretly write dark poems about cutting myself, about heartache and pain. Yet I would have a smile plastered on my face and would never talk about my real emotions. No one said to me that it was okay to not be okay. So, I am telling you this now. It is okay to not be okay. You can still love God and be going through a time of great pain and loss. You can cry yourself to sleep at night and still remain faithful to the Lord. You may experience times of depression, fear and anxiety, and still be a fully committed Christian. I am telling this to you now. It is okay to not be okay. I am saying this from a safe place. For the longest time I was judging myself. How dare I think certain thoughts or act a certain way. I am a strong believer. My name is Sunshine. I always have to act happy and put together. How dare I experience any other emotion than, fine. I would encourage you to talk about whatever is going on beneath the surface. Talk to fellow believers. Open up to trusted counselors or Christian therapists. Be honest, be vulnerable and be real with yourself and especially with the ones around you who love you and who want what's best for you. Not only do I encourage you to be open with others, but also be honest with God. Tell him exactly how you feel. God always has the time to listen. If you are angry at God tell him why. If you're feeling sad or lonely, express your concern and fears to the Lord. He can take your honesty. The Lord is a great listener. Refer back to the miracles of yesterday and let them encourage your faith today. Trade your sorrows for God's peace. Receive His love and genuine care for you. To admit one of my weaknesses, I so often use work progress to give myself meaning and value. I struggled with approval addiction for the longest time, wanting other people to like and applaud me. I would work harder and produce even more results just so I could get the praise and attention of my peers. Throughout the years I had to learn that my value and my worth does not come from what I do, what I produce, or the stuff I buy. I can do absolutely nothing and still receive love, attention and approval from God Almighty. I am wonderfully made and knit together. Jesus Christ sacrificed his life and I need to just accept his gift of salvation and enjoy a life that honors him. I would encourage you to base your approval and self-worth in the eyes of Christ. You can be confident and stand on your own two feet knowing that all of heaven is behind you. I am not independent. I am fully dependent on God. Self-care Self-care can look different for individual people and what works for me may not work for you. I am the biggest critic of my work. Did you know that? I can pick up a book I wrote six years ago and think, that's awful, and ultimately discourage myself. I need to start speaking positive things about my creative endeavors. No one is a master at their craft right out of the gate. I need to give myself room to grow and mature in my skill set. 
I am trying to be more conscientious towards myself. I need to slow down and celebrate the small milestones in my life instead of hurrying up to complete the next goal on my to-do list. I need to speak up when I am feeling stressed. I need to be calm and patient and kind to myself. I need to slow down and celebrate the small milestones in my life instead of hurrying up to complete the next goal on my to-do list. I would consider myself an overachiever. I take great pride in making progress. I love to set goals and I literally have every hour of my day accounted for. I am extremely disciplined and I can work, work and then work some more, leaving only a little me time throughout the day. I will even use my days off as an opportunity to complete more things on my to-do list. In fact right now is my hour lunch break at work and I am using this time to type up more pages for this book. The bad thing about my daily discipline is. I don't always know how to relax, be spontaneous and just have fun. To purposely slow myself down from this full speed ahead schedule, I started treating myself to some personal self-care. Let me tell you about my favorite day of the month, properly dubbed my ADIB, stands for all day in bed. On that designated day, I will sleep in, not physically getting out of bed until around 1pm I will buy candy, chocolates, and order any fast food meal of my choosing. I'll have a number one with a large sweet tea. Please note, this unhealthy diet only lasts 24 hours, a cheat day if you will. I will then spend the rest of my ADIB in my pyjamas on the couch, watching a movie marathon. This day usually occurs when my husband is working so I'll watch the corniest chick flicks, the most romantic of dramas, and the cheesiest comedies. I will also pour myself a relaxing hot bubble bath, extra bubbles, with aromatherapy beads while reading a magazine. That entire day, I am off the grid and completely unplug. Again that's my me time. My husband Travis does things a bit differently. Travis will go walking and running every night for an hour after work as a way to de-stress. He likes to play video games and watch wrestling to let his mind decompress. Travis also prefers baths instead of a shower so that he can intentionally slow down and breathe before heading into the office. Jeff Hosfeld chimes in, I de-stress by working on crafts or going on a drive with my wife. I believe that the way God created us is that we need a break in order to recharge our bodies and souls. God rested on the seventh day not necessarily because he needed to, but as an example for us that we need to have a time of rest. What about you? What are your stress reliefs? What calms you down? After a long day at the office, what option do you turn to for some much needed downtime? I'm asking you to do something for yourself. Take care of yourself. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 29 AMP says, For no one ever hated his own body but instead, he nourishes and protects and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. I need to feed my body the right nutrients. I don't smoke or drink, but I am guilty of eating tons of candy, chocolate, cheese, bread, and a long list of other food items that are not good for me. I remember one time going to my physician for a regular checkup, and I was just very overweight. My arms were popping out, my legs were blowing up, and my hips were huge. I recall an embarrassing but true story. At work, I told the security guard that I was going to take a walk outside the building. He then warned me that it was about to rain. Jokingly I responded, oh. If it starts to rain I will just run back inside. He looked at me concerned and then asked, should you be running in your condition? I clearly had a puzzled expression on my face so he added, I mean you're pregnant right? I was not pregnant and that interaction was a wake-up call to how I was treating my body. How could I gain so much weight so quickly? My cardio workouts include running walking over 16 miles a week. I also jump on the trampoline lift weights, crunches and jump rope. I assured my physician that I stayed active in my workouts and regimented exercise routines, but I never changed my eating habits. The doctor explained that I need to have a healthy diet along with my exercise. From that day forward I traded in my carbs for vegetables and fruits. The truth is, I did not gain all of my weight overnight. 
I had accumulated each pound with every order from the takeout menu. My bad decisions eventually caught up to me, and I had the bathroom scale to prove it. I want to nourish my body with the best possible diet and eating habits. Fortunately for me, I have my husband to lead the way. Travis is very particular about what he eats. He wants to make sure his meals contain no fake sugar, no ingredient that causes cancer, and stocks our pantry with organic and quality food items. That also means no soda or coffee at home, just water, you don't want to drink your calories. Travis allows himself to splurge once in a while as I do with my ADIB, but overall, he is set on his diet and stays active. I have followed in my husband's footsteps, literally, and I am happy to report that I am back down to my normal size. I weigh myself once a week, but I do not gasp over a pound gained. I just want to make sure I am heading down the right path to maintain proper health and wholeness. I want to make sure I am heading down the right path to maintain proper health and wholeness. For those who follow me on social media, you may have seen all those pictures of desserts I tag from various restaurants. I post these delectable treats because I see it as a big deal to treat myself every now and again, like when I celebrate a new book release. So, maintain that balance as you take proper care of yourself. Part 5 Why Do We Not Help? It's become quite obvious that our families, our communities, and even our nation is in need of some healing, but that all starts from within. I am going to ask the questions that I think we all need to ask ourselves. Can I be the sunshine? Can I leave this world in a better condition than how I found it? Can I be a positive influence? How can I make my community a better place to live? How can I help? Can I be the sunshine? There are plenty of volunteer projects we can sign up for and non-profits that certainly need our resources and money. There are opportunities left and right to assist others, but it would seem we are just not ready to make that commitment. Are we just stingy with our resources or frugal with our money, or is there something deeper that we're not addressing? I know people who do not tithe to their local church because they do not believe that God will bless them and provide for them. Is this why we don't give? Because we ultimately don't trust God. I am guilty of saying yes too often giving time and attention to people so much that I literally feel drained of energy and then pout, well what about me? Is this why we don't try? Because we are afraid we'll be depleted of our resources. What are we afraid of? What is holding us back? This world needs a makeover and for that to happen, we need an internal do-over. We need to restructure the family household. Can we be a loving family? We need to restructure the human heart. Can I be a loving person? God help us. Excuse number one I don't have the time to help. I heard someone say recently that no one has the time, we need to make the time. We must be intentional about bringing kindness out into the world. I also have a rigid agenda, but I need to allow some flexibility in this area. If I can't stop and help someone, then I've missed the point as to why I am here. No one has the time, we need to make the time. Let me introduce you to Ileana Reyes who is a business owner, wife, mother of two boys and Bible study teacher, leading small groups for the past 15 years. In fact that's how Marcia Baker and I met, we attended one of Ileana's leadership classes at our church. You can read more about Ileana in the acknowledgement section and she will be sharing more of her personal insights later on in this book. I ask Ileana to share some of her thoughts on intentional living. She tells me, it is hard to help others when we are very busy. However, if we decide to take action, the process is achievable. I'm a very busy person. I manage our family business, take care of the household, co-lead a small group, host missionaries from our church and also take the time to connect with friends, family and neighbors, helping them when I can. It is a decision, a choice to make a difference in people's lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 NLT states the right time is now. 
Today is the day of salvation, emphasis mine. We have 24 hours in the day, we have plenty of time. We need to prioritize our time. By stepping out, volunteering, or doing something nice for someone, you'll realize that you do have more time than you realize. When I have an idea to make someone's day very special, I'll write down my plan of action, so it then becomes a part of my schedule. Ashley Bingham adds, Sometimes we can get so caught up with our own lives, our own needs, and what's happening to us, that we become blinded to the opportunities that arise to lend a helping hand to someone else. Many times our reluctance stems from the belief of putting ourselves first, and while this may be necessary in some instances, as we are guided by wisdom, there are times when our selfishness blocks a greater blessing from God. Ashley challenges me by asking, can we find it in our hearts to extend a hand to someone who is in an even worse position than we are? She makes her point clear. For some, giving money, food or even clothes is not a problem, but God may be calling us to help in a different way by giving of our time. We all get the same amount of time to work with in a day, and how we use that time is important. If we take an assessment of the last few days, how much time did we spend helping someone else, whether it was praying for them, teaching them, counseling, ministering, or just being present to listen and to be of support. Our lives can get so busy with our jobs and the kids, with school and all the various organizations and boards we sit on, that there isn't much room left to help someone by giving of our time. Our excuse becomes, I don't have time for that now I'm busy. I agree with so much of what Ashley is saying, as I often blame my busy to-do list as the reason why I don't stop and help. Ashley states, I remember when my job took up most of my time and when I did have time to spare I used it to focus on myself. While that wasn't a bad thing because self-care is important, the problem was that I never set aside any time to truly help others. When the opportunity arose for me to help, you guessed it, I would complain about how busy I was and how much time I did not have. Sound familiar? This young woman claims that, finding the time to be helpful and giving to others is something that has to be intentional, especially if our lives are very busy. The effort is on us to ensure that we keep our eyes and ears open, so we don't miss the cry for help from our brothers and sisters. Sometimes the best way for us to help is for us to be a connector. Even if we can't personally help, we may know someone who can. There are many ways in which we can offer assistance, and let's not forget the power of lifting someone up in prayer and interceding on their behalf. I love hearing Ashali's insight on this subject as she teaches me to be more intentional and thoughtful. Right now, I am making a list of things I will do that can spread more sunshine out into the world. Love is an action verb. I am an introvert by nature. I can spend hours upon hours just by myself. I like to do solo activities like reading, writing, watching movies, or going for a walk. But I make it a habit to reach out to one of my friends and ask them to dinner, or go get some coffee with me. I purposely open my schedule to include other people so that I can spend time with someone, offer a listening ear and give out hugs. I mark my loved one's birthdays on my calendar, but I won't just type a happy birthday online post, but instead I will mail out an actual celebratory card or send a small gift in the mail. I even give out valentines on my favorite holiday, and once a month I sit down and write a long handwritten note to one of my good friends who lives in a different state. I know how important it is to receive some good news in the mailbox. Today is the day. I ask Ileana Reyes about her personal efforts to use love as an action verb. Missions are very close to my heart, Ileana says. As a family, we have supported missionaries for many years. I personally sponsor the youth to go on mission trips because of the amazing experience I know they will have. I went on a mission trip to Poland and it was life-changing for me. We went to a high school for two days and had conversations with the students and teachers. The most amazing thing was that the teacher said to us, you think you came for the students but you came for me. That teacher invited us into her house and it was beautiful to spend time with her and get to know her better. That evening we held an outreach event 
and the teacher went and brought us some of her jewellery as a token of gratitude to us. After the event ended, the local pastor informed us that in all the years receiving mission groups, it was the first time that a teacher attended an outreach event. Ileana shares this story with excitement in her eyes. We also got to minister to the brothers and sister in faith in a church in Poland. We prayed over them and spoke encouragement and love to each person. It was a beautiful experience. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9 AMP says that a man's mind plans his way as he journeys through life, but the Lord directs his steps and establishes them. I must continually give my schedule over to God. I will ask God to help me with my plans and goals for the day, but ultimately he's the one who orders my steps and progresses me forward. Like I said before, I have every hour of my day planned out, but recently at the end of a Bible study, someone wanted to stay and talk with me. I knew I couldn't look at the clock or be antsy about my time. I needed to give that person my complete and undivided attention, even if it sets me back a little on my next activity. I need to follow the guidance and leading of the Holy Spirit and remember that God is in charge. I also want to be aware of my surroundings. Is there a co-worker who needs some attention? Is there a friend who would love some guidance? Is that stranger having a bad day and requires my patience and understanding? I need to read the room and add light to any darkness going on around me. I need to read the room and add light to any darkness going on around me. Colossians chapter 4 verses 5 to 6 NLT advises us to live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. I want to make the most of every opportunity I am given. While Jesus Christ walked on earth he never turned down anyone who sought him for guidance prayer or time to just enjoy his presence. God has an entire universe to manage, but he still takes time for me when I call out to him. Can I not practice that same courtesy to others? Excuse number two, I don't have any money to help. I don't get paid until Friday. I have student loans to pay off. My car needs an oil change. My son's birthday is this month. I am saving for my vacation. The house needs a new fridge. I just can't afford to give financially right now. Does any of that sound familiar? I will admit, when God tells me to give out of my pocketbook, I tend to talk back. Maybe I heard wrong or God, I need that money to buy something for myself, I argue. I am so happy that the Lord in his sovereignty is patient with me, and has truly matured me in this area. I am someone who takes personal accountability for every dollar I spend. I wouldn't call myself frugal. Okay, maybe I would. I'm just not quick to open up my wallet. Yes, I do tithe. That is the very first thing I give out of my paycheck. I personally write out checks to ministries, missionaries, evangelists, and churches. I even give money to a local homeless shelter. I am fully convinced that God is using my small efforts to make a big impact for his kingdom. I am fully convinced that God is using my small efforts to make a big impact for his kingdom. I would encourage you if you are not already to start tithing, giving God 10% of your paycheck. This sacrifice truly is a gift that keeps giving. I know God will honor your faith and respond to your needs as you give selflessly for his divine use. I am reminded of Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 MSG, where God tells us to bring our full tithe into the temple, with this promise attached to our obedience, test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. The act of tithing does seem hard at first, but the more this type of giving becomes a consistent habit, you'll experience firsthand how this charitable act not only benefits others but also works in your favor as well. You will see God do extraordinary things with the remaining 90% of funds you have left over. So when you start tithing, or if you are currently giving, be excited and expectant of God's hand of goodness as he pours down an overflow of blessings over your life. 
Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 5 to 6 NIV points out that you are to seek the place the Lord your God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. To that place you must go there bring your burnt offerings and sacrifices your tithes and special gifts, emphasis mine. I talked about giving a 10% tithe but what about the special gifts? Opportunities do come up where I am able to love others with my money and special gifts. One of my husband's love languages is receiving gifts. He absolutely loves it when I go out of my way to buy him a present or pick him up something from the store. Travis counts all of his gifts under the tree on Christmas morning. He'll even recall certain unique items given to him when he was younger. It could be sharing my dessert or purchasing a collectible figure for him online. When I buy Travis something, he just has the biggest smile on his face. If we love someone like really love them then they have all of us, our time, energy, our attention and yes even our money. I try to make it a lifestyle to give and to give generously. A lady from my church offered to pay for my drink at the coffee shop. That was a special gift to me. An older couple picked up the check for my husband and I when we all four dined out together. A good friend of mine treated me to dessert. You get the idea. I am talking about a kind act that is personal to the situation and unique to the person. A special gift is something you went out of your way to spend money on to show love to someone. Let me be cautious and say, bless within your means. I am not asking anyone to empty their bank accounts. I know money is a sensitive issue. We all have bills to pay and monthly expenses. Take care of what you need to take care of. Just be willing to follow the Lord's leading as he instructs you in this area of giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7 MSG says, I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. Let this verse be your guide as you decide on the amount you want to give. Think of every financial gift as an investment opportunity. You are investing in someone, helping to grow their future and planting seeds for their faith journey. Jeff Hosfeld shares his story. My wife and I often bless others with money. We try to listen to what God impresses upon our hearts to share. One time we were in line at the store and paid for someone else's groceries. Another time we gave a child our loose change. There have been many times when I blessed others with small tokens of God's love, whether it be money or some other kind of gift. It is not about me or the gift, but rather the unconditional love of giving without expecting anything in return. I see the smiles and joy it brings. This generous act opens doors for me to be able to share the love of Jesus to others, for it is not about me but all about Christ. Let me warn you love is not spelled M-O-N-E-Y. I know someone who would throw money at a problem thinking cash could fix it even though what I really wanted was his time and attention. So give your money and your generosity, but do not let this be your answer to all. Your relationship, presence and personal connections to people are far more important. I view this subject matter very simply. If God tells me to give over my regular tithe, then I do it. And if he doesn't, then I feel I don't need to. Tim Stromer echoes by saying, don't give under compulsion. Give as Christ directs you. Excuses, excuses. We all have a million excuses as to why we can't or won't do something. I get it. I work several jobs and still try to make time for God, myself and my husband. My to-do list is always full. But how hard is it to just be nice to someone? How much time does it really take, maybe 10 seconds, to text someone an encouraging note or to write a positive comment on social media? That's the beauty of love. It can be given at any time to anyone. Love is the easiest gift to give and truly the most impactful. Tim Stromer is a father to eight and grandfather to three so he can easily use the excuse of, I'm too busy or I don't have enough money, but instead he says, if we are seeking God first, his kingdom and his righteousness, the Lord says he will meet all of our needs.
We get to freely pour his abundance out on others. There are certainly some perks to bringing generosity, compassion and kindness out into the world. It's the old adage you reap what you sow. I like to believe that when I go out of my way to bless others, God will go out of his way to bless me. I don't try to give with an ulterior motive, but I also know that if I plant and sow seeds of goodness and love, I can expect that same favor back. I wake up every morning fully expecting God's divine favor to rain down over me. I live with my hands wide open to receive all good things as I spend my days sowing generously to others. I wake up every morning fully expecting God's divine favor to rain down over me. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 25 NIV reminds me that a generous person will prosper, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I worked at a theme park for a handful of years. Some days I felt miserable working outside getting rained on and dealing with angry guests. And on those days I would be intentional about sharing the sunshine. I would write a story or a poem as a just because gift for my co-worker. I would buy my fellow associates some candy or publicly praise them on a corporate recognition site. I would do something positive to make another person happy and in a way, my day would suddenly shine brighter. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 NLT gives me hope. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full pressed down shaken together to make room for more running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. I claim this verse over my life. If I am in need of a miracle, I will bless someone the same way that I need a breakthrough. If I want financial favor I will open my pocketbook and give it to charity. If I need encouragement I will go out of my way to affirm others. I would encourage anyone going through a difficult season to sow their way out. What I mean by that is take your focus off of your trials and stresses and go out of your way to sow financially, give generously, be intentional about blessing others and watch how God opens the floodgates of heaven in your favor. I can feel highly insecure about my author career. I have a horrible habit of comparing myself to other writers. I can feel depressed that I am not at the level of success I want to be. But instead of living in that negative mindset, I take the focus off of myself. Each month I feature other authors, entrepreneurs, business owners and artists. I will highlight other authors' books and conduct featured interviews on my website, www.sunshinerogers.com. Such blog series include Book of the Month, What's in Your Bag and Time to Share. This is a free service and the reason I do this is because I want to support others out in the community and I feel good promoting such talented individuals. We all have different talents and specific skill sets. You can bless others on your level on your time at your pace using your unique gifts. I once knew an artist who would give out individual art pieces as a way to make people smile. I still have mine hanging up on the fridge. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 GW says to let your light shine in front of people. Then they will see the good that you do and praise your Father in heaven. Another perk of helping others is that you give God the glory. It's a fact that people around you are observing you and they will see the good things you do and lift their eyes to heaven. This is ultimately why I do what I do, to point the way back to Jesus Christ. Can I make a difference? I believe that what I do makes a difference. I believe that every prayer I pray creates powerful and active responses from heaven. I believe that the giving of my time, my gifts and my love will plant seeds that will grow into a bountiful harvest for God's glory. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 17 to 19 MSG, to tell those rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money, which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God, who piles on all the riches we could ever manage, to do good, to be rich in helping others, to be extravagantly generous. If they do that they'll build a treasury that will last, gaining life that is truly life. This verse reminds me of the eternal value of showing God's love to others. We have the assurance that our ministry efforts will not go to waste. 
God is laying up treasure for us in heaven, and everything we do say or give for his name's sake, he adds another gem to our crown. Matthew chapter 5 verses 14 to 16, NLT, encourages me. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead a lamp is placed on a stand, where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. When I spend time in prayer God notices. Every time I follow him in an act of obedience, God sits up straight. When I give above and beyond my tithes and offerings, God smiles at me. God keeps tabs and writes a list of all the good things I do. Even when I feel like what I do does not matter, God gently reminds me that my genuine acts of love make a difference. Everything I do for the kingdom of light creates a dent in the darkness, and for that, I know God is appreciative of my work and devotion to his name. Everything I do for the kingdom of light creates a dent in the darkness. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 minus 2 NIV encourages me to arise shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. I want God's glory to be seen upon me, and the only way to do that is to be active and intentional about following Jesus Christ. When I share love, when I remain humble, when I pray for and serve others, God's glory is seen and his name is honored. These seemingly insignificant acts serve as a reminder to the world that God is still moving. I want to invite the presence of the Almighty and his transforming power to move through my life, into my community, and into my family. I can't give up. I need to stand strong in my faith and be the sunshine. Acknowledgement section. A special thank you to my contributors. Tim Stromer. Tim married his high school sweetheart and they have eight children, three grandchildren and one more on the way. Tim and his family have lived in the same 1800s house for almost 30 years. Tim is the president of Jesus Food, jesusfood.org, where the vision of the nonprofit is to see God eradicate starvation worldwide. You can connect with Tim. Email timstromer at gmail.com. A-S-H-A-L-E-E Bingham. A Jamaican native, Ashley Bingham, graduated from the Northern Caribbean University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Management Studies. After spending over six years in the tourism and hospitality industry as a wedding planner, Ashley entered the world of entrepreneurship. In November 2021 she self-published her first book, The Lies I Told Myself. Having gone through a period of self-discovery and reflection, Ashley developed a passion for finding purpose, and is now on a mission to help others discover who they are, by reconnecting to their creator and living life unapologetically the way God intended it, without fear or reservation. You can connect with Ashley. Instagram at Asha underscore Bing. Facebook at Ashley.Bingham. Blog dreamlifeessentials.wordpress.com. Stephen Stein. Stephen Stein is a prayer line supervisor with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. In his role, he manages a team of 40 prayer line associates, providing all aspects of leadership including ministry guidance to his team. Stephen has over 30 years of ministry experience in various leadership roles within the church, including over nine years of higher education experience at a Christian university. Stephen received his bachelor's degree in ministry from the University of Valley Forge. Stephen currently resides in Charlotte, North Carolina with his wife of 28 years and their fur baby Ellie. Jeff H.O.S.F.E.L.D. Chaplain Jeff Hosfeld Sergeant. Rhett is currently serving as a chaplain for Volusia County Sheriff's Office and on the 24-7 Billy Graham Evangelistic Association's prayer line. He retired in 2017 after 32 years of combined law enforcement experience, both civilian and military. He has nearly 17 years of combined armed forces service, four years active duty and over 10 years service in the Air National Guard, 
including protection detail for President George H. W. Bush, both as Vice President and President, and also deployed as part of Operation Shield Storm. He has experience in such areas as a patrol police officer and command sergeant, which he retired from, K-9 handler, crime prevention specialist, McGruff the crime dog instruction for preschool and elementary schools, traffic radar instructor, anti-terrorism level 2 instructor, crisis management in Virginia schools course, U.S. Department of Homeland Security threat assessment for large facilities training, U.S. Department of Homeland Security course for major incident commanders, VIP personal protection specialist course, ICAC officer certification, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association certification for law enforcement chaplains, certification as an occult and satanic symbols crimes investigator, along with many other specialty areas of expertise and training in both civilian and military. Chaplain Jeff Hosfeld has a strong calling to serve the first responder communities across the country. Chaplain Hosfeld has a strong connection with his brothers and sisters in the blue and true calling, pointing them to victory in Jesus Christ. He believes that God gave him the gift of service when he accepted Christ in October 1971 at Dale City Baptist Church as a young boy. Chaplain Jeff Hosfeld has been married to his wife Becky since September 1988. He was diagnosed with cancer in 2011 which he is now in remission and battles daily with the effects of treatment since that time. However he has taken on the motto of, not I but Christ with the meaning that all that he has done and does do is not for him but our Lord Jesus Christ. Josh. 2415b. You can connect with Jeff. Email jhosfeld at liberty.edu. Facebook at jeff.hosfeld. Ileana Reyes. Ileana was born and raised in Puerto Rico. She has been married for 32 years and is the mother of two sons. Ileana and her family own a pest control and termites inspection business going on for 14 years. Ileana is a John Maxwell coach and trainer and a Maxwell certified behavioral analysis trainer. She also has been leading small groups for the past 15 years including a youth leadership group and a parenting leadership group. For the past couple of years, she has been co-leading the Ladies' Leadership Development Group at her home church, Faith Assembly in Orlando, Florida. Ileana's passion is to help others discover their God-given gifts, their personality styles, and their strengths as a way to reach their full potential and become agents of change at home, in the workplace, in the community, or in their ministry. You can connect with Ileana. Email ilianapurpose at gmail.com Instagram at Ileana Living Now. Facebook at Ilian Aries. Marcia Baker. Born and raised in Florida, Marcia met and married God's gift and the love of her life, married 40 years this December. God has given Marcia two amazing incredible adopted children, whom she is so very proud of and is so grateful for. Marcia has a heart for people and animals and when she's not working on her writing, she is running her daughter around and caring for her two border collies and a cat who thinks he is a border collie. Marcia is always available to help someone God sends who just needs a friend. Marcia is a certified John Maxwell coach and a graduate of Stage to Scale. She is working on her life and family and has a heart for second chances of all kinds. You can connect with Marcia. Blog MarciaRuthBaker.com LinkedIn at Marcia Baker. This was such a fun piece to write and I want to express my appreciation for everyone who helped make Be the Sunshine a literary success. I want to thank Bill Vincent and the editors and designers at RWG Publishing. Thank you for believing in my vision and for working tirelessly, sculpting this manuscript into a masterpiece. I always appreciate your collaboration and support. I want to thank my literary contributors, Ileana Reyes, Stephen Stein, Ashley Bingham, Tim Strommer, Marcia Baker and Jeff Hosfeld. You all are so amazing. Thank you for sharing your testimony and personal stories to add to this piece. I appreciate your hard work and effort to meet deadlines and assist with the overall message and integrity of this book.
May the Lord bless you for your openness and transparency. God is doing wonderful works in and through you. Thank you to Portraits by Life Touch for the photo images in this book. I had so many ideas for the look and design of the covers, and it was wonderful to see those ideas come to life. Thank you for adding your creative touch to this project. I appreciate your feedback and sharp eye to make every photo so perfect. I had such a great time researching scripture to use for this book. 87 Bible verses representing 9 different translations, NLT, MSG, NIV, NKJ, AMP, ESV, CSB, NRSV and GW, were used for clarity, easy to understand passages with relatable terminology. My husband Travis Rogers is my rock, my right hand and my world. I learned so much from this man of God. I am greatly influenced by Travis' inner strength and passion for life. This man has my heart forever and I love being married to my best friend. This book, these pages, my entire existence would not be possible without Jesus Christ. The only reason I can be the sunshine is because a Savior revealed his heart to me. Thank you Lord Almighty for not only being the inspiration behind this book, but for providing fresh ideas for all of my books. I look to you, depend on you and live for you solely as my Lord. Thank you for reading Be the Sunshine. This book is a call to action. We want to make a difference in our families, our community, and out in our world. Tell me how you blessed someone today and use the hashtag, hashtag Be the Sunshine. Make sure to tag me and I may repost it on my site. Spread the love and get involved. One act of kindness at a time. Hashtag Be the Sunshine. Sunshine would love to hear your review of this book. If you enjoyed the content and the message, tell her what you thought on Amazon.com or any other book retailer site. Sunshine loves hearing from her readers. If you need prayer for anything, let her know. She would love to pray for you. Connect with author Sunshine Rogers. www.sunshinerogers.com Facebook at Sunshine Rogers Books Twitter at writer underscore sunshine. Instagram at author sunshine rogers. Follow sunshine on amazon.com and goodreads. A sneak peek into chapter one. Dash 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 dash. And I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 18 AMP. Dash 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 dash. God as the Father. Dash 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 dash. A little boy skips home from school. Daddy, daddy, he screams with enthusiasm, holding up a piece of paper with a red A marked on the front. The father filled with excitement comes to the boy's call. Dad, I got an A in my math class. Dot and Billy, my best friend, we played kickball together and Jennifer, I don't really like her but she saw me in the library. The dad, knowing his boy's story was going to run long, picked up his son and sat him on his lap on the couch. And then my teacher gave me my test back and... The boy continues on with his story. What do you think, dad? What do you think, the boy asks. We are the boy in that scenario. Even to this day we are still asking the same question, daddy what do you think? No one can free us like a father can, no one can affirm us quite like daddy. No one can show us our purpose and our identities like the man you look up to for hugs and bedtime stories. The picture-perfect scenario is you cuddling up to him, his big embrace always there to hold you, and you looking up to him with assurance, wonder, and warmth. While that picture sometimes does play out, the reality is more like, where is my dad? The phrase, what do you think dad, has become a rare phrase indeed. Whether you are 4, 14, 45 or even older, everyone longs to be heard, to be loved, assured and respected. Our father's priority to us can make all the difference. It's hard to put the definition of a father on paper. Even a dictionary has a hard time explaining the role of a father. The only proper definition is a male parent. One explanation is, a man who exercises paternal care over other persons, paternal protector or provider. 
The world is confused about what it should be. These pages are not supposed to be a gripe session about the fathers who failed us. We can't change certain people and we can't change our past. As frustrated as we get, some of us have to live with the truth that we aren't going to get that reality of a dad tucking us into bed, dancing with us, singing in our ear and helping us and supporting us in whatever we want. Or can we? There is one father who would never give up on us, there is one out there who would never leave and who would love to have a relationship with you. This daddy wants to hear you talk about the good and the bad times in your life. He still wishes you would come home yell out, daddy daddy, and let him hold you on the couch as you talk about your day and who you encountered and what happened. Even if we do something wrong that really hurts him he still shows us love and mercy. Psalm chapter 89 verse 28 NLT says, I will love him and be kind to him forever, my covenant with him will never end. He will still choose you when something bad happened by your own doing and stand behind you when you did wrong. If he needs to attend a parent-teacher conference, he will. If he needs to talk to a co-worker on your behalf, he will. He is behind you 100%. He has no intention of leaving or letting you down. This man I am describing is God and indeed this dad in heaven loves you. God is not just some faraway man in some faraway place called heaven. This is a God who isn't just going to stay on his throne. He walks and talks with you and he is here with you in this room right now. His life isn't complete until he has you with him. He wants to travel along with you on your journey, talk to you and give you advice. You are his life's purpose and love. In Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 4 NLT it says, Father, you have been my guide since my youth. God will and is right now leading you. He is giving you answers to life's most difficult questions. However, you can't just come home, put your headphones on, listen to your music really loud, and shut out what God is saying to you. You can't expect the answer to be there when you purposely quiet the voice of God. God is just like any other person on this planet. He will talk to you but let's make room for him. Show God you care about him. Let's spend time with him. Turn the TV off. Put the phone down. We all have things to do and lives to live. However, without our dad, we can only go so far before we wonder where we are and what is happening to us. To get to know him you have to hang out with him, ask him questions and let him talk back. I am not implying that you go to a restaurant and talk to the empty chair on the other side of the table. I don't think the waiter will ever come to take your order. I am implying however to talk aloud in your own home, in your own room etc. as if he is right in front of you, because he is. He is your dad, where else would he be? He is going to guide you in all the answers that you need in your particular circumstance right now. He is the dad who grabs you by the hand and says, I'll get you through. I'll tell you what I think. I'll tell you what I would do. He is actively persistent to be by your side for your whole life. You have a dad. Your God your dad knows you. Matthew chapter 6 verse 8 NLT says, Your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. He has been your dad for as long as you have been alive. He has watched you and has seen you develop and grow. He knows who you are, what kind of personality you have, what you do and what you need help with. He knows his son and he takes care of his daughter. Anything that you do doesn't surprise him. He knows your favorite color, movie and book. He can answer a quiz and be the only one to get all the answers right, no matter how hard you try to make it for him. God is your father in the fact that he is willing to look the other way. Be merciful as your father also is merciful, states Luke chapter 6 verse 36 KJV. God our dad loves us even though we are human. We are going to hurt probably everybody at least once while we are living. We all say act and do the wrong things, we all offend people. We are sarcastic, angry, offensive, obscene and dirty. Come on let's face it. But we all long to be ourselves around people we love, we want to show our entire hearts to those around us. We want to be comfortable in an environment where we can be good and not so good. 
We want someone in our lives who can love us and excuse us from our ugly sides. Matthew chapter 6 verse 14 talks about God forgiving the ones he loves. God knows that you cursed out the taxi driver and he saw you yell at your friend. He knows what just happened and he still loves you and wants you. He still thinks you are the best thing that has ever happened to him. He still wants to hear what is going on. He still wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't want you to go anywhere. He's forgiven you and he will tell you that you are forgiven, in case you use that reason to ignore his love. He doesn't want you to leave. God misses his son and daughter on your busy days. He puts you as a priority and would love it if you would do the same for him. The things he wants to show you and tell you are remarkable. God wants you to know that when you are with him, he will take care of everything. He takes care of little birds outside, providing for their shelter and worms in the ground. Matthew chapter 6 verse 26 the message describes the scene, look at the birds free and unfettered not tied down to a job description careless in the care of God. And you count far more to him than birds. He does this because he cares and he loves them. He finds pleasure in his creation. You are his ultimate creation. He created you in hopes that he would have someone to converse with. He wants to have company, he wants to have a friend, and he wants to have a family. There is no one else comparable to God himself, but God still made us similar to him. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 the message says God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. The us in that verse refers to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit forming man with their traits. God wanted someone with his looks, his genes and his bloodline. He places value on you and sees you as his own. God knows what is on your heart right this second. He knows if you are happy with your family. He knows if you are frustrated with the people in your life. He knows if you are desperately in search of something. Your dad, your God understands that you have certain and specific needs and wants in your life. He knows you are craving that promotion, that you need money until the next payday, and that you need a certain person to call you back. He is very aware and very active in your life, and he will make sure to give you all that you need. Matthew chapter 6 verse 32 confirms that your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. It may not come today. It may not come tomorrow. A delay does not mean that he is not working in your favor and not working for you. There is a whole dimension going on above our heads. The heavenly realm is swarming with activity. Don't think that the angels are just singing all day and care nothing about you. Don't think that Jesus' scars on his hands are just for decoration. The heavenly realm is in hot pursuit for you. Because you are family, you are God's son and God's daughter. Anything that happens to you happens to God. He is your dad and he feels your pain. He cries when you cry and gets mad when you get mad. He may be the God of the universe, however he is very personable and useful to you. He is on your side. As your dad he would rather walk through life with you than without you. It's better if he can hold your hand and hold your heart and enjoy this thing called life with you. God is just like the perfect father. He gives good gifts to you. Matthew chapter 7 verse 11 NIV says, If you then though you are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? It doesn't matter if you just sinned right this second. You are still his child. He looks after you, protects you, and is able to give you things that you need. He brings you friends at work. He brings money out of nowhere, he brings favor and blessings when you don't deserve it. He gives you a good day where you are surprisingly cheerful just because he can. Your father, your God thought about you today. That's why he made sure your favorite team won this year. He made sure you saw the sunset during your evening walk. He made sure someone made you laugh today. He knows what you like, he's been watching you this whole time. The fantasy scenario of a perfect father is still true and still happens. I know we all have been hurt by our family members in some way. That pain is very deep and very real. 
The good news is there is a dad who loves us. When we have the worst day he holds us tight and loves on us. He makes sure things get right again. He sings over us while we fall asleep. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty saviour. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs, Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 NLT. He is our dad and he acts like it. We don't have to live in bitterness, anger, sorrow and depression if we don't have any real family. God your dad is family and he's not going anywhere because he loves you. God will do what any dad does, he will tell you about life. He will tell you about yourself and your situation. He will slay the dragon for you. His love is by far better than anything or anyone this world has to offer. God wants you to trust him and in order to trust him you must know him. You must believe in him, you must believe that he exists. You may have your doubts but if you give God a chance, he will show up and talk back. He will be there when you need him. So go ahead and give him a call. Shout out his name and take a moment, you'll see he loves talking. Another thing God loves is sharing. God made heaven and earth for his sons and daughters. He loves blessing you and sharing his goodness and his love. He enjoys sharing ideas, creativity, dreams and secrets. He's just like you. He would never tell a secret to someone who can't keep it, so be the kind of son and daughter who God can trust. It pleases God to give his kids his life's work, and as it says in Luke chapter 12 verse 32 the message, the father wants to give you the very kingdom itself. Like an earthly father, he wants to be able to pass down the family business. It's God's dream to give you the job of growing the kingdom of God and glorifying his name on earth. It's a compliment, he wouldn't give his kingdom to just anyone. It says in Matthew chapter 16 verses 16 to 17 that God in heaven revealed to Simon something the world could not and did not tell him. It states that Simon knew Jesus was the son of the living God verse 16. Simon only knew this because of God telling him. God was sharing that information with one of Jesus' apostles, and he can let you in on stuff too. You are not going to find the answers from the world and if you try to you will feel lost. Everyone has their own opinion. Even your own heart can get confused. God is the only one who knows all. He knows your situation and knows where you should go from here. He knows what you should say next. He knows and cares and would love to share it with you. You just have to be willing to stop and listen. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. John chapter 5 verse 20 NIV Papa, Father you can can't you get me out of this. Take this cup away from me. But please not what I want, what do you want? Mark chapter 14 verse 36 The Message God will share things with us but what if we hear something that we don't want to do? You can ignore God's word all you want, God then just uses life circumstances to speak to you. Don't ask God for anything unless you really mean it because he will talk back. If you don't want this relationship, don't pursue it. It will bring you love, peace, answers and hope, but it will require something of you. God is like any dad, he wants his children. He doesn't want to give up any custody rights to anyone. So even though you fall in love with your high school sweetheart or adopt a little child from India, God still wants to be the person you talk to during the day. He still wants to be the person you come to. He still wants your relationship with him to be the most important relationship in your life. When God tells you something, a faithful and obedient child will follow, with no strings attached. However, we are human and we all have strings attached. We all automatically want answered, what's in it for me? We all want to see the vision of the prize before we start running. We all want to make sure our journey in life is stable, functional, and realistic before we even sign up. The part about God is that he operates in this earth, but his residence is in heaven, so he functions on a completely different level than us. He wants us then to trust him. 
We cannot see everything and we cannot know everything. Quite frankly I think it would scare us if we did. So we need a God who is looking out for us. We need a dad who is acting in our best interest. If he says to do or say something we need to trust him. He's the only one who knows what is fully going on. If something happens that is completely out of our comfort zone or very unexpected, we have to trust that God knows what he is doing, and our dad in heaven has it all under control. He sees how one event leads to another and he wants to lead us. We also then must be willing to follow. Travis Rogers is a 35-year-old who is a TV news producer. He describes God as being a dad for him since he feels like his dad wasn't really there for him most of his life. Even though Travis feels like his dad did the best he could, he still saw his father put work ahead of family time. When Travis was growing up he may not have had his dad to guide him or do things with him, but he still feels like God made everything okay for him by showing him other ways to learn things or gain wisdom. Travis says that he had his mom who was his best friend and God, and he felt like he was never lacking anything. God blessed me as a kid as he still does now. Travis exclaims. Dealing with events that took Travis out of his comfort zone was much easier with God. This young man learned to give it all to him. The hard times in my life have been shielded by God's love and protection he says. Travis knows that everyone is going to go through hard times, but he claims that as a Christian you do have an advantage over those who refuse to acknowledge the glory and power of God, His Son, and the Holy Spirit. Travis advises that when losing things in life like people, jobs or possessions, immediately go to God. I make sure He is the one who carries my pain and my burden. I come to Him for healing for comfort and love. I let Him fight all my battles for me, when I know I can't win the battle for myself, which is usually every battle, says Travis as he opens up about his losses in life. Travis remembers when God gave him a job when he needed one, and God led him to places and gave him things. Travis states that he is God's child, the child of a perfect father who has never left him and never lied to him, and has always provided for him on every level. No matter how low my bank account may get, I always had what I needed and more. And sometimes I may have to wait to get the things I want, but it is okay. He always reminds me of how much I already have in the meantime, Travis closes. Someone I know also relies on God as a father. Beth Hall is a 23-year-old who works as an administrative assistant, as well as being a part-time campus pastor to Chi Alpha Christian Fellowship, who hopes to serve the Lord each and every day in whatever path he leads her. This girl has traveled to and from places without a car for years. She has been a student and is now in a full-time profession without a vehicle to her name. She knows where the bus stops and schedules times for her daily routine. However, she gives credit to God for never being late to work due to lack of transportation. She feels like she's always been able to get to places and always had a way to get home and to church on Sundays. She says taking the bus gave her a ministry opportunity for people in her community, using the time to pray for people, share the gospel with them and create friendships with those on her bus route. Even though anyone else could feel some aggravation and annoyance living without a car, Beth keeps a good attitude. I don't feel like God is withholding good things from me. Beth described a personal story where a father held on to a good gift until his child's birthday. Beth has the perspective that God's got her future car, and that he'll give it to her at the appropriate time, similar to the father in the scene. She doesn't doubt God's faithfulness to her since at one point in her life God called her to join a mission trip to Kenya, and years later that direction came to fruition, and she spent a summer in the place she knew God wanted her to be. Beth feels like she is using her time to experience God's intimacy with her as his heavenly daughter. I am having all of my cares taken care of, she says. She knows that her heavenly dad would give her anything she desired, if that's what would make her happy. During the time of writing this, Beth saw her miracle happen, and after three years, she is a happy owner of a new car. God is your dad so thus he also knows how much you can take. He wants his daughters and sons to grow up strong and mature. He wants his children to fight with him in a spiritual battle. 
He dreams of the day when he can teach you how to pick up your sword, the word of God, and defeat the enemy with it. He wants this for you because he believes in the potential you have. He knows how far you can go and how deep you can be. The reality is we don't know these things ourselves. So when bad times hit, we think we are sinking and drowning. The whole time we yell at God for help. We paddle furiously trying to get out of the storm. We hurt and we scream out our frustrations, anger and sorrow. We feel like we can't take it. However, God uses those situations for you to get closer to him. He then talks to you about what you need to work on. He points out what your weaknesses are for the sake of helping you get rid of them. He comes close and wants to be personal while you survive the hardships of climbing the mountain. You will see why God took you through the hard times and you will thank him for the mountaintop view. For a moment you cannot believe how far you got and how deep with God you are. God's mission is not to lose you in the storm but to help you survive. Sometimes the only way to survive is with him leading you out. Let's say you moved into a new apartment with just some money in the bank and some clothes you've kept since you were 12 years old. You are in desperate need of furniture, food and appliances, the list goes on and on. You look over your money and there is no possible way you can pay for everything. This scenario has happened to some of us in our lives. We find ourselves with a big endeavor and not enough resources. We really don't know where to go from that first step. That's when it is handy to have a person who is an earthly father and a heavenly father. He not only cares about you and your predicament, he helps.